Good morning. Good morning. What would we like to do this fine morning? Uh, let's take a look here. Um, I think we're just, for now, we're just going to keep on the kind of pace and direction that they were going before. Um, Roger. They were moving at point, point 0.15 or point 0.2 knots. What were they doing? Yeah, they were going uh, 0 0.18. All right. Cool. I believe. Is that what you have as well, Steve? Yeah, they... They were planning on a 0.15, but we can do up to 0.2. That's fine, too. Uh, and were they moving in steps or just tracking? Uh, they were moving in steps, okay. I okay. believe. Yeah. 100 meters? Yeah. OK. We can keep doing that. 0 0.18, 100 meters? Yep. OK. Same Some bearing. Some touch for me, Tim. Bridge, Nav. Uh, can we put in a move for one zero zero meters on the same bearing? Thank you, ma'am. Oh, uh, Roger, stand by. Yes, it was. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, bridge zero one one. Thank, thank you. Oh. Well, it's really steep. Let's see why she has the camera way up there. Well, good morning, everyone. Four to eight is in the house. Whoop, whoop. Ready to spice some things up. Right? A little bit of spice. <laughs> Not a little <laughs> bit of spice. Um, I'm Dejana Figueroa, Science Communication Fellow for this watch. I'll be with you. I uh, just want to give you an update for those of you just joining us. And we're um, underway. Awesome. Uh, in this dive, we're exploring the western platform of the Palmyra Atoll at about 7.7 .7 kilometer transect was planned up slope. Our goal has been to characterize the geological and biological aspects of the seafloor on the flanks and summit of deep portions. Our entire dive is going to be between 3,500 and 1,700 meters, meters depth along this track. And we're excited for y'all to uh, join us as we explore this section. Dan, were you talking to yourself or? No, I was talking to Antonella. Oh, okay. She's Got really quiet on the. Ah. Uh. A little bit. Is it just me or? It could be. Everyone always has different settings. Coverage watch. You have to yell at me. I'm that deep. <laughs> Seventeen of four. Right. Is it? Is it? Uh, yeah. Not sure. I think it might be a. Like maybe a sea cucumber? Last one. No, the one buzzing around in the lasers there? Yeah, the in front of the lens, yeah. I'm not sure. No, the thing that was swimming. Yeah, yeah, that's what oh. I was looking. Oh, yeah. Huh. Like you're looking cool. at the thing next to the sea or something. Or whatever it is. Can't tell what it is. So, Steve, we're looking for rock samples still to collect for geochemical analysis of the lava composition and dating. 
Yeah, we're we still have our eye out for one more. Um, we can take 10 uh, according to what we're able to take from the monument. Um, so we're trying to be very selective with our rock, so rock choices. Um, but it's good that our onboard geologists have been able to make those collections overnight and uh, get exactly what they want. Yeah, that's still the plan. I think um, you know the rocks are harder to find, uh, really, in these uh, kind of more sedimented slopes. But when the dive was planned, uh, you know, it's it's not unusual, or it's rather unusual, to see these heavily sedimented slopes at a uh, you know 35 to 45 degrees. Um, it's possible in certain places, but um, unusual. Cool. Because the, the steeper the slope, the more unstable the sediment can become, or sometimes the more current swept uh, these areas are. You get a sense of how steep it is looking yep. sideways at it there. Oh, yeah. It sounds like there's a microphone open somewhere, like a speaker. Does anyone want to get that feedback, or is it just me? I'm not getting any feedback. Mm, feedback here. Is okay. your uh, side tone way up? need a PhD to be able to figure out how to work the side tone. <laughs> Negative. Oh, it's we've three got button clicks. Well, maybe more because you have to search the menu. We've <laughs> got a lot of good mornings coming through. Uh, wanting to know if we have a team name for our shift. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we need one. We sure do. do. Too spicy? <laughs> Too spicy. <laughs> I was that thinking the exact numbers. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> two spicy, four watch, with a two and a four. <laughs> <laughs> two spicy, four watch. I like that. Um, let's see if we get some suggestions coming. <laughs> but we have, we have uh, not developed one just yet. Opening the floodgates. <laughs> oh, and we also have a class that's tuning in right now that had an interaction yesterday with Jordan and myself. Awesome. They're saying hello, so and hello. they're asking how long, if there's a time delay between what we're seeing and the feed that they're watching in the classroom right now. One of her tech-savvy students is interested in that. About four seconds. Look at that, four seconds time delay. And I don't know, let's see. It's like think the speed of light, right? <laughs> I thought it was enough time for Tammy to beep me. Bleep, bleep. Oh. <laughs> Speed of light, that could be our watch name. <laughs> Wait, we don't want to give Dan ideas, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we've got some coming in. I don't know if I should share some of these. <laughs> Danger. <laughs> Too spicy for watch, okay. Um, the Spicing Guild. Sure. The spicy you're squad. Gonna, you're gonna lose Argus. Yeah. If I zoom in at all, it's gonna gonna go away. Let's see here. How's that? Good for now. So there was a few rocks over yeah. here. I'll come back, but I don't. It seems like the pathway we're on was. Yeah, that that was probably the best. Um, did you touch any of those uh, with the vehicle? Do you know if they were loose? I did not. Yep. But I'm sorry, I come back through my dust here. No, yeah, we could just keep keep going up. I made a I made a jog to the left there on after sonar and targets. So. Yep. Where's this coming from? That was it's uphill. I haven't been there yet. They cause a mudslide. Follow up question about that four seconds. They just want to confirm that's how long it takes 
for the data to be beamed to the satellites from the middle of the Pacific Ocean to space to Rhode Island and then to their classroom via the internet. They want a confirmation on that. Four seconds. Roughly, yes, that's what happens. It goes from our satellite out and then to shore, from shore back out to, to the internet and then to all of your computers and devices. Four seconds, people. That's, that's fast. Speed. <laughs> I am speed. <laughs> what depth was our last rock collection? Do we have that written down on the sample sheet? Um, it looks like they neglected to write down the depth. Okay, we can, we can search for it in C log now. That rock right below the lasers looks like it might be wiggly. Yeah, this well. looks like a good little path here, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, well, let's see uh, how far into this move are we? We are, uh, we got 50 meters left. Okay. Let's, let's keep going up a little bit more because this seems to be like on the right track. It looks like it's picking up a bit, a little bit more rock substrate in this area. Uh, okay. Drop down another five. S some cool geology questions coming really in steep, right now so you should be able to as we're down. searching for Almost rocks. It says here, are the geologists dating these rocks using uranium lead methods? And what other types of methods do geologists use to date rocks? That is a good right. question. Um, so we have one geologist on board who's going to be dating some of these rocks. Um, but she uses an argon-argon dating method instead That's of uranium lead. Sweep it out to um, the side a little. So and to okay. kind of determine which you use, um, you can kind of make an estimate for yourself as to how old you think it's going to be. Some dating methods work better than others, depending on the age of the rock. So there you go. As we search for rocks, there's different types of dating methods, and the geologists choose the right one for the rock, I guess. Yeah. It's not hitting Argus. So our yeah, last rock right collection was at 2300. It's really steep, so as long as you're behind me, you know, we're, we should be alright. We, we could potentially go another 50 meters in depth uh, before we take another rock. What is that thing? I know. It's like an acorn worm. It has the shape. Zoom in there, Tammy. It's a big one. Acorn worm. A uh, <laughs> sediment deposit feeders. Just vacuuming up the sediment. Very similar to a uh, the sea cucumbers are extracting all that nutritious uh, organic material from the surface layer. That's its head on the right. Yep. Tail. Wow. Head on the right, tail on the left. Lots of good sand in the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and jelly, gelatinous body, you can see it pulsating. Probably from us, not from it. So bizarre. That, really, I know. Oh, we've got a group of middle school age students visiting the telepresence room at UNH in the USA right now, and they're checking things out. They want to know about the tools and capabilities of the ROVs, and they'd love to hear from the pilots if they have a time, if, if, if it's a good time. Tools and capabilities.
Uh, what kind of what tools are you talking about? Like what we have on board? I think so. Well, our two, uh, our main tools are the uh, manipulators. Or the yeah, sorry, I'm under. I'm in a yeah, no spot worries. here. Now uh, we have two seven function manipulators on the vehicle that we uh, used to sample with. One is a teleoperated. What is this on the right hand side here? Rescued by Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sea spider. Wait, sea a sea spider? Yeah, big one. I don't think I've seen a sea spider before. This might be a 4K candidate. Yeah, Raj. As long as. Uh, you might have to come up, Antonella, because I'm going to come It's right actually kind of bizarre that it's just sitting there on the sediment. Even in the sea, you're not safe from spiders. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the sea. I, I would argue that these are actually more terrifying than land spiders. I, if yeah, you just like right out. If see what they're cap of capable of doing. This one, I don't know what it's doing, but... Uh, waiting for they, us. They are pretty <laughs> vicious when it comes to predation. They uh, they have a very long proboscis that they'll use to like slurp up their prey with like a, you know, like a straw pretty much. Uh, okay, so you're telling me that this sea spider can take out like a... a Coral sponge. What? And just slurp it? Zoom a bit there. <laughs> Maybe, I haven't seen them on sponges, but I've seen He's them uh, like slurp up whole anemones. Um, corals, uh, hydroids. Uh, what else? Where does it go in their tiny little bodies? <laughs> it's, it's not a fast process. No. Time is a very relative thing down here. True. That um, seems to be a theme. Yeah. How big do they get? Uh, this is a pretty big one. Um, I mean, they, they, there's some species from the southern southern ocean that actually, uh, yeah, they display you know gigantism, so they get you know this big like a dinner plate. Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna That's have a good time sleeping tonight. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Uh, good thing. Good thing you already slept, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're right. Yes. If it's not the birds on the surface that'll get you, it's the sea spiders below. <laughs> oh, no. We're at eight meters to uh, finishing this step. Would we like to continue on or stop and look around? We have some time, so let's uh, let's get some imagery of this. Roger. So y'all may have noticed that Steve was saying that this might be a 4K candidate. We do have a 4K camera on board Hercules. Okay, so Steve, you might be able to zoom in there. All right. We're going to try and get a good shot. Tammy can zoom as well. This one's pretty mobile. Yeah. yeah, let me try and sneak forward a little bit here. Come on. Well, there you go. It's pretty good. Yeah, so th this one doesn't look like it's feeding on anything, but the proboscis is kind of on the far side uh, of this one right now. On the other side, it's a long, thin red uh, structure extending from the mouth parts, but it's also got a bunch of manipulator appendages there. Uh, there you go, like sea spider. Ours. Uh, interesting thing about these critters, a lot of, so their, their tissue actually covers the entirety, entire length of their legs and they breathe through their skin basically. Um, so they don't have any specific things like gills or gas exchange structures. It's all through diffusion across their, their membranes and their tissue. And, uh, Obviously, space is at a premium in these kinds of you know body plans. So they'll oftentimes you know, put gonadal material, reproductive material, in their legs. Um, 
uh, swell up when they're in reproductive mode. But you can start to see the proboscis now. It's kind of this large, Which one is it? large red structure right okay. there. Yep. Okay. They'll kind of stick that into a coral or a sponge and you know, slurp it up, basically, after uh, injecting some digestive juices. Well, uh, okay, wow. You yeah. Yeah, do not want to be... Uh, I don't. I do not want to be that sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay to do a 4K shot now, or you want to line that up any better? I can line it up a little more. Oh, for the yep. For the um, viewer just tuning in, we are currently looking at a sea spider, and our lead scientist was just giving us a description of some of its biological features and how it is a predator in this deep sea environment, and it has the ability to eat sponges and corals using its proboscis and digestive juices and sucks sucks the creature up. Yep, pretty much. That's how it goes. You zoom out for a second. There was some Steve. really great imagery of sea spiders. Steve, can you zoom out for a yep. second? Yep, zoom it out. Thank you. That's good. There was some great imagery of sea spiders um, on a cruise I was on a few years ago on the Okeanos Explorer, we saw uh, yeah, sea spiders eating whole anemones, uh, several of them attacking a bamboo coral uh, and eating the coral polyp by polyp. So once these things do find a meal, they'll kind of just sit there and, and take advantage of that. Try and zoom in there. All right, pushing in. He's moving pretty fast. So. Getting the uh, getting the Yankee now. Got it. No, you don't. <laughs> they, I mean, I think they move relatively that, fast compared to some That's it, Steve. Of the I got it. All right. All right. Good. Sorry. Let's let's move on. That's kind of cool, Steve. As you can see, Argus is about to uh, swing into the hill there. <laughs> Antonella is way past the double-digit altitude threshold. Is there a significant layback at this depth, or what are we sitting at? No. Um, it's just a really steep hill, so <laughs> she's 20 meters to the north of uh, gotcha. Hercules, which puts her, uh, she's coming up a little now. She was trying to break my five meter altitude record. <laughs> she was within a meter of doing it. Yeah, not sure how f fast they can go. We've got a question about how fast the spiders can go. I just noticed that they move faster than other things we've seen down here. That was about as fast as I've ever seen one move. Um, yeah, usually they're they're fairly sedentary. They don't like to move very much. I'm gonna swing off to your. Uh, you could imagine, you know, when rain. when all your gas exchange and you know waste exchange is done across your you know, skin and your membranes that you don't want to exert yourself too much. Especially because, what, what are we looking at for oxygen down here? Okay. Um, Got a 100 micromolar, so low, but not crazy low. It's a great uh, Argus shot, though. Yeah. can really see that intentional 4k hotspot when I was yeah a little right bit there. I knew we were gonna have that but uh, 4k <coughs> one of our tools is the 4k camera looking uh, right in front of the vehicle about uh, a meter in front of the vehicle so we've and it really likes to light so we've concentrated some light there which is really painful for the video engineer because uh, every time we get low, they have to adjust the iris on the... On the I think we can throw in another move now, whenever uh, you're ready. Yeah, or no. Let me get yeah. back up okay. the hill here. We finally have uh, some rock features here, Steve. As you can see in Argus. Oh. All right.
What else do we have on the ROV until now? Drawing a blank. Got manipulators. Got knives. No axes. Suction. Sam I have questions about sample collections. Like where do we put them in the ROV and stuff? Um, yeah, so the ROV has two boxes on it. One is in the front of the ROV. Um, we can put biological or geological samples in there. We also have a starboard box um, where we can put all other sorts of samples. Um, on the starboard box, there's also a set of core tubes where we can put sediment samples. Um, on the forward of the ROV on top, um, you can kind of see like right in the middle of the light bar in the front of Herc is the suction sampler. So there's eight jars where you can slurp up stuff um, with the tube that's held by the arm usually. Um, what else? We can take water samples. Uh, so on the port side, you can kind of see it in the Argus view right now. There are the Niskin bottles, which are bottles that when we um, pull a trigger, they'll seal. So we'll capture whatever the water was flowing through them at, at when we triggered it. What am I missing? Pretty good. Yeah. I think you said scoop earlier, but you might have been off SPL. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, we have a scoop. So sometimes we'll use that to scoop up, you know, sediment or nodules. We were using last cruise. Um, yeah. Are those tools always on Herc, or do they change depending on what the plan is? Good to go, is? Dan? Nope. Okay. Yeah, most of the ones I described are on Herc quite a bit. Um, sometimes, like, if the scientists don't care about water samples, we won't put the Niskins on, because they make it really, really hard to maintain the vehicle from the port side. Um, Sometimes scientists bring on um, their own sort of sampling devices. Like my f my very first year, I remember someone had these. Can't really explain how they work anymore. I've forgotten, but like these gas tight samplers, where they were doing sort of gas monitoring of things underwater. So that's pretty cool. When sometimes there are some pretty sophisticated instruments that are brought it's on board thing. and put on. See it. See that gelatinous blob on the bottom. Yeah. is bizarre. So I think what we're looking at here is a carnivorous tunicate, but I've never seen one with this particular pigmentation. Yeah, Actually, right. we might have two things here. We're gonna wanna spend a second here. Roger, ship stopped. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think what we have here is... Something being eaten? Predation on a predator. I'm going to go out and uh, go on a limb on this one. So I think the, the first animal we have here is a carnivorous tunicate, kind of right here. You can see, uh, I think it's Megalodicopia is the genus name. That's for many of these. Blob. That's yep. the jelly blob yeah. part. And so the mouth parts are, you know, down here. But I think on top here you have a type of uh, a gastropod, uh, which a number of years ago we called the purple orb, uh, actually off of the coast of California, but it's actually a type of snail, um, yeah. snail relative. And that is this animal right here. And it looks like it's on top of this other tunicate. It's not clear what it's doing, actually. Um, 
It could be predation. I don't know much about these. Uh, I forget whatever we're calling them. Uh, purple something. Yeah, the the scientific name for the purple orb. Tammy, you want to zoom out for a second? I'm just gonna hit the ROV just slightly. But we, we've seen things like this in in other oceans too. But it's a very very unusual observation. That would be if we weren't in the monument and had didn't have restrictions on what we could collect, that would be a very interesting collection to figure out what they were doing. If it's some sort of commensal relationship or, you know, maybe if it's a, I don't know, predation. I think uh, it was a velatunid snail. Velatunid, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the one. Yeah, this, this is very, very unusual looking. Yep. Oh, for a tilt on 4K. Yeah, maybe we can get a better angle on it in the 4K if, uh, if we had a tilt actuator, we could. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. I might have to. Can you zoom out for a second, Steve? Yep. Uh, it's definitely not a better angle. Yeah, so the last I heard from the pur purple orb is that it was being CT scanned at Harvard's MCZ, figure out what it was. But these uh, these types of marine snails and relatives are really poorly known, especially in these parts. So the best we can do in most of these cases is just get good imagery and um, hope that we see it elsewhere. Okay, you can try a bit of a zoom there. Both, both zoomers can zoom away. That's the best I can do with 4K. That's all right. I can try that's, again. that's all right on the 4K. Don't worry about it. We got, we, we got some pretty good imagery of it before. Yeah. It's really neat. Some of our viewers said in the last watch there were a couple of tunicates that were super weird looking <laughs> and large. But this is a new thing. Yep. <laughs> no, I don't hear anything. All right. Well, this looks good. I think we can move on. Roger. Kind of looks like the orifice on the potential snail closed up. Yeah. With the, when the sediment came through? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's not surprising. They have a couple of tentacles that they'll use for sensory, um, yeah, sensing, sensing the environment. Very cool. I've never really seen anything on these um, tunicates, the solitary uh, carnivorous tunicates. Occasionally you'll see uh, a commensal um, polychaete living inside of the, the mouth. Uh, presumably it's kind of feeding off the scraps of what the tunicate eats, but it's never actually being consumed by the tunicate. Okay, if you guys are happy. Yeah, we're happy. Uh, both zoom out. Underway. Sounds like there's lots of strange different you know, types ready of for a associations move? in the deep yeah, sea. <laughs> that's one of the things that's the hardest thing to capture, right? We, we see these animals you know, free living all the time, but the associations are also really important because they tell us about how the uh, animals zero interact zero with each other in their one environment. One. Can we do a uh, point two or point three? And now? it helps to sure. also At, connect uh, kind of knots, food please. webs. Uh, you know, how energy flows it's through the deep, deep sea. So. You know, if we know how certain species okay. interact with others, whether it's predation or parasitism, we start to understand you know, how energy flows. And, you know, that's something that's hard enough to do in the shallow ocean, but we're in, when you're only taking a snapshot, you know, a second in time, um, you know, and then coming back maybe years later, if you're lucky, we really have to kind of infer a lot of information from the observations we're making. 
Hey, Steve, are you okay with a slight speed increase to 0 0.2? Sure. Right. Uh, where, where are we going slower before? We were going 0 0.18. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, we couldn't do that. Okay. Buckle oh. up. That o extra 0.02 oh is going to make a big <laughs> difference. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I thought we were still doing like zoom, zoom, five zoom. or something. <laughs> no. We can, you want to drop back down or keep it at 0 0.2? Uh... We could try 0 .2. Hey, Tammy, I've got some questions about the camera. Is the ship was actually reaching 0 0.2. The HD times. camera? I can barely hear you. Oh, I don't like we're this out. Going is channel 3 the ah, HD deep. camera? Yeah, yeah. Uh, channel 3 is the 4K right now. Oh, okay. Channel 3 is 4K. I got a 4K for Christmas, now I want to tilt for my birthday. Just coming <laughs> up, by the way. Dan's just never happy. No. Nope. Yeah. Hard to please. <laughs> More cameras. High maintenance. So ship moves underway at 0 0.2. Right there, 0 0.2. All right. Steve, is now a good time for introductions, who we are and where we're from? Sure. Why don't we start with you? Sure, okay. Our lead scientist. Yeah, my name is Steve Oskarich. I'm the lead scientist for this expedition at sea. Uh, I am joined by some colleagues ashore, uh, geologists from the University of Rhode Island. Um, they are currently probably tuning in. Um, so let's see if they may pop on through the day uh, as available. Um, but I am a postdoctoral researcher in uh, at Boston University in the Department of Biology, and I study deepwater corals, seamount ecosystems, uh, the ecology of the seamount environment, and uh, yeah, I'm generally focusing on the Central Pacific for a lot of my research. Can we zoom on the sponge? Sure. A lot of my dissertation work was conducted in the Central Pacific and, and tropical latitudes, so uh, trying to better understand the diversity of life we have out in the, these types of environments. Thanks, Steve. Uh, what is a postdoc? <laughs> Someone who spends a long time in school. <laughs> uh, yep, so uh, now I'm two years post-PhD, so two years beyond my hopefully last degree. But a lot of uh, postdoctoral work is kind of just independent research uh, on topics, you know, writing grant proposals, getting funding for uh, different types of research projects, and conducting those research projects. Uh, There's often some maybe teaching or mentorship involved. Iris is gonna. I'm gonna turn on another light, Tammy. You ready on the Iris? Got it. Uh. What do we have here? Can I stop the ship if we're moving? Sure. Bridge nav. Hold position. It kind of looks like a glass sponge to me. Yeah. Dan, can we uh, take a small piece of this sponge, maybe one of the lobes? It's pretty small. Sure. What do you think? Yeah. We'll do a, probably a tear and slurp. Probably going to have to cut it. I don't think it's going to slurp up on its own like the last one. No, it would probably take the whole whole thing if we tried that. Yeah, we, we don't want to take the whole thing. Do you think you can get it, or is it too small? No, I can nip a piece off and then feed yep. it to the slurp. Sure. Let's do that. So, glass sponge. So, what was it about this one that made it an immediate Make yes, stop. stop the ship? Zoom in a bit more there. NA-137 sponge Remy. requests. <laughs> ah, <laughs> particular species, I see. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, these types of glass sponges are very poorly known from this area, and they're generally requested by our scientists ashore. Um, so since we're not seeing as many corals in this area and more sponges, um, this is a good opportunity to uh, get a very small piece of this to better understand the diversity of sponge life here. A tiny little brittle star. It's a baby. 
on the rock behind this sponge. Yep, yep. What a one. Oh my goodness. Data, is jar four open? Um, yeah, container four is awesome. open. Thank you. Welcome. I really want to tilt 4K up, but this is exactly why it's tilted down. Oh. Steve, for sponge growth and shape, is there any reason or cause for the different morpho morphological forms we see with these glass sponges? Yeah, th there's a few things. Um, so, you know, they, they generally, have a, generally have a typical shape, but there's always deviations from that shape. Um, the, the environment, especially the the flow environment that the sponge grows in has a tremendous effect on the shape, um, especially if it's a stocked variety. The stocked sponges will often grow, you know, in the direction of the prevailing current, you know, down current, so to speak. Um, this one doesn't seem to be large enough yet to really be influenced by the flow, but maybe the kind of the dome of it could be. Um, you can see it has a, a long stalk. Thank you, Tammy that it uses to attach the substrate, and sometimes that, that can be affected by flow. Uh, in other certain circumstances, more so for corals than for sponges, they can their growth can be affected by um, the presence of associated organisms, uh, like crinoids. You know, they'll often grow around or you know bend at the point where their associate is attached. You're happy with that? Yeah, it looks good. That snip right there. Yep. Snipping. Just a small piece is fine. Great. Question from the internet. Do the sponges consume or, I guess, gather CO2? Uh, they, they do, so they don't have true tissues uh, like some of the higher metazoans. So metazoans being animals. Um, so sponges are typically called the most primitive type of animal and they don't have true tissues, but they do consume oxygen uh, the cells within their um, within their bodies. That's good. Okay. Typically, we'll do a screen grab and in the jaw. Good. Got it. Got it. And then stow it. Yeah. So they do consume oxygen um, and produce CO2, uh, but they're not they're not necessarily consuming CO2, but they do sequester carbon to some degree. So sequestering carbon just means that, you know, as they grow, they'll they'll take up carbon into their tissues. The glass sponges, I'm not so sure about the quantity of that, but some of the larger sponges, uh, the more voluminous sponges, um, definitely have the ability to sequester carbon. Is that is that like a thing uh, with the deep suction? sea creatures yep. and their carbon sequest? Like, is that a thing? It, it's it is a thing. Forty percent. Um, uh, more. You know, a lot of these animals yeah, at this depth. Fifty, forty, fifty, yeah, something like that. Okay, you're at fifty. Uh, are you know th the largest sources of carbon? You know, aside from you know maybe outside the sediments. Um, so things like corals and sponges. Uh, you know, when they grow, particularly for uh, corals. When they grow, they produce skeletons, which you know, take in uh, carbon and you know make carbonate out of their or calcium carbonate and very various carbonate minerals out of their in. Uh, in order to grow yeah, in their skeleton. Stop, see if it falls down. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't I say it's a huge reservoir, going. but you know. <laughs> but it exists. It exists. 
and you know it's it's sequestered it outside of the surface uh, mixed layer, shake on the jar. which is kind okay. of what's the important thing Back and forth. when we talk yeah, about sequestering carbon. You want it out of the the, the flow, layer. the flow yeah, of really the atmosphere, strong. and out of the flow of the surface ocean, because it's yeah. carbon's going to have Go a much longer the, residence uh, time in the deep sea. Or the other way. Uh, it's really not moving. With there it is. Yeah, there see it is. It. You got it. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Out of that. You can uh, rotate all the way around if you how to do that. Okay. I just move Argus a little. It's there, Dan. We all saw it. Yeah, I think they want a screen grab of it in the jar. Is that right? No, he said in the snips. So I, I think this might have might be colophagus, but I'm not sure. There's a bunch of different types of sponges. It really isn't that kind of have this morphology and it's definitely not there's a few factors. I see you clicking it. <laughs> it's not listening. <laughs> yeah, it's I'll been write that down on the finicky. I'll try to just to get it back to flush. There's a few characteristics we usually pay attention to when we're trying to identify these sponges, namely the you know the overall morphology, uh, how it's attached to the rock is different for different families. So one family might have glass fibers that bind it to the rock. Some might be just kind of concreted onto the rock surface like this one. So that would suggest that this is probably in the Rosellid family. When you say concrete, like they use a mucus or some sort of biomaterial that allows them to cement themselves? Push it, back in if it's you just, want it's, I, I'm not sure of the exact chemistry of it, but the yeah, they usually create a a base like this that you know, binds the glass spicules to the rock. I'm not sure if there is an actual material that's involved with that. That's good there. I've got some questions about biomaterials and sponges. There's probably an area of study the there. Sure. There's uh, yeah, <laughs> sponges are incredibly rich sources of um, natural products. Uh, so different sorts of Fortunately, chemicals. Can't get a good focus on it because of the lighting. Yep. Uh, Probably have evolved over millions and millions of years in the sponge. Better. And uh, it's current, currently an area for later, more like investigation uh, among uh, animals like and different types of environments. Yeah, I don't know. It's not. You know, it, it may take it humans years and years to develop a here. drug, Back either a from little. synthetic or natural products, but these animals have been doing it for millions and millions of years. And uh, they're pretty good at making what they do. The, the key to understanding and potentially using these products and pharmaceuticals or things like that, uh, you know, are to really understand the, the ver diversity of products and which genetic lineages produce which compounds. But it's like it's, uh, it's stock has twin something mm -hmm. like little see-through holes in the middle there yeah yeah that it's sometimes uh are those holes yeah looks like it sometimes they have small snails associated with them too and then we've got a bunch of little, little arborescent tiny. foraminifera on the on the background here so this is a this is a type of protist animal too when you zoom in, you see all sorts of different things. You know, you've got brittle stars here. There's foraminifera here. Probably some small xenophyophores in the rock that are you know, barely visible. Yep, there's one here. I can't help but wonder if there's a reason that they cluster together. Is there something about this spot? Yeah, uh, we can zoom on and zoom out and, and continue, Dan, when you're ready. I'm ready. Um, yeah, so generally things will cluster around substrates that are favorable uh, to them in the deep sea. So obviously hard rocky bottom is great because you can attach to it. You can't really attach to sediment very well. Um, but also areas that are slightly elevated compared to their surroundings are also uh, high quality habitat for suspension and filter feeders. Um, 
this is in part because you know whenever you have a bump and you know, you're in a flow, so the water's flowing around us, water will move faster over uh, some sort of topographic high point in an area. And when water moves faster over that area, it's delivering more food particles per unit time. And so you end up with you know, basically a, a buffet on top of these peaks versus kind of, you know, <laughs> scraps at the, the edges of the rock. Just on the iris there? An okay. ideal yeah. place to, to sure get the nutrients, I guess, then. get what you need. No, um, yeah. check Steve, this do out. you have other uh, things you want to take a look at here? Or do you want to keep moving? Uh, we we'll yep. keep going. Keep going? Yeah, that RV. sounds good. Good to go. Right there, good to go. Bridge now. It's fine. Oh, got a shout out here from a friend with her class, sixth graders from Savannah, Georgia. Um, they want to know how long this particular mission, this ROV mission, is going to be in the water. So when did we start? Jordan, do you remember? Didn't we get in at like 9.30 yes yesterday? around that time? I think so. And I think the idea was to go for 24 hours for this particular mission. And what we're doing here is we're on a, a transect and our goals are to collect rock samples along this transect for geochemical analysis of the lava and Anyone dating, yeah, looking for iron manganese the crust the composition. Oh, and we're also yeah. going to be identifying animals and characterizing the benthic habitat that we see on this transect along the slopes, ridges, and valleys. We're zoomed in a little bit. Do you want it wider? Oh, so funny. there you go. Shout out to my friend in Savannah, Georgia. Hello, sixth graders. And Thanks for joining us. This is a 24-hour ROV dive mission to uh, do geological and biological sampling out here along the western flank. Like any of these rocks, Steve? There's a... Yeah. Um, there's a... Uh, we have one rock uh, option left. But let's keep going up a little bit more. Right there. We're underway at 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.17 at the moment. Going up to 0 0.2, but let me know if you want to drop down again. Yeah, that 0 0.2 seemed okay. 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 My reptile brain had 0 0.5. Steve, I have some follow-up <laughs> science questions about the um, sponge that we were just looking at. They wanted to know if the brittle stars were going to try and climb up the sponge like they've seen in some other corals and whatnot. Does that happen to sponges as well? It does. It does. You do see that quite a bit. Um, some brittle stars will. Some brittle stars won't. Depends on the species. Some brittle stars are more deposit feeders so they'll be feeding on the rock uh, and organic material that deposits on the on the seafloor and some of them are more planktivorous perhaps and so they would climb up to a high point and kind of feed within the flow got it so it kind of depends on their feeding mechanism and what strategy is going to work best yeah oh. um question about the sponge growth. We took a little sample from the sponge. How long does it take for sponges to grow? Very good question. Very difficult answer. Um, we don't know, really. Uh, it's very hard. So it, it, it's there's some methods out there for dating sponges now that are um, getting easier to use uh, and more reliable. But generally, uh, glass sponges don't have huge amounts of datable, datable material. You know, they're mostly made out of silica spicules. And so, um, still an open question, you know, how fast they're growing. Uh, the best evidence we have for growth rates are things like um, deep sea wrecks or debris uh, uh, that we're, you know, we have a known possible ol oldest uh, date for something and then you know go, we go back to it or we find it years later uh, and it has some sort of community growing on it we know you know it must be at least or up, up to you know that age from when it sank or when it, uh, it was deposited on the seafloor it's tough to do it in a kind of open world environment like this
it's starting to pick pick up a slope a little bit here. Yeah, Get we some just more had a little hard uh, rock. What I was hoping was a cliff, but micro. Oh. Did we get a species ID on that glass sponge that we were just at? So it's it's a, a Rosellid sponge in the family Rosellidae, but um, could be Colophacus, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, there's something that looks like it in uh, the Okeanos Explorer. NOAA Oceanic Explorer Animal ID Guide that's identified as Colophagus question mark, which is always good when there's a question mark because it means that your collection's pretty valuable. So uh, we're going to go with Rosellidae for now. I need to drop another weight. Lead weight, just one. Couple more shout outs so. from our schools that we've been interacting with. So again, hello, Savannah, Georgia. Thanks for Already tuning done. in. And hey, Houston's oh, out there. It looks like to we're yet. gonna talk to you tomorrow. Oh, so I'll thanks for tuning in. Budwig Intermediate, ISD are you Houston. Are talking about dropping an Alvin plate or reballasting? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's already a winch in there from yesterday that the RV is too heavy. Yep, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Dead stick there, and we're getting like two meters a minute. We never wrote down percentages um, uh, in auto depth. Do you still want to do that? We did yesterday. Okay. All right, as we're going through checking out rocks, I'm getting some geology questions. So I'm gonna ask Rebecca, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, your location, um, you know, and your station, and then I'll, I'll send you the questions over. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm Rebecca Lippett. I'm sitting in the data logger seat for the four to eight watch. Um, I'm a second year PhD student in marine geology at the University of Rhode Island. And yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. So shout out again to our classroom students that are watching. They are interested in these rocks. Um, how are the rocks formed? What type of rocks are they? And can you confirm if this is a lava flow? Yeah, so if we're looking at these rocks on the seafloor, they're typically going to be volcanic in nature. Um, the dark color, right? So they look black. We're also typically going to see basalts coming out of these submarine vents. Um, yeah, and so when hot lava hits cold seawater, you tend to get these formations called pillow basalts, right? So we can see that in some of the flows that we've been going over. Um, they're a bit more rounded, um, good, good kind of look there. like tubes to in ten. some instances. <laughs> And so that's how they're formed. They're still in the teens on your So there you go, future geologists. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Rebecca, Volcanic do you know, rocks. Do you know how old these rocks are? I don't. Um, that might be a question for Amber. I think she has some dates for some of the rocks in the area. Um, but I don't know if she has them for Palmyra specifically. I think that's one of the things they're trying to discover, right? So Yeah, she's going to yeah. be uh, dating some of these rocks eventually using an argon-argon method. I was like, I just forgot. My brain was like, uranium something? What's the name of the method again? Argon-argon. Um, Got it. Yeah. Argon-argon. What does that mean? Like, if I'm just thinking about my, since I have a couple classrooms on here, right. when we date rocks, what, is that, what does that mean? Um, when you use methods like uranium lead or argon argon, you're looking at different um, radiogenic isotopes of those elements. Um, and so with something like uranium lead, 
um, after a certain amount of time, um, that uranium parent will decay into um, a daughter isotope is what they call it, right? And so by figuring out which daughter isotope you have, you can figure out how old the rock is um, because it takes a certain amount of time to get from the parent down to the daughter. But it's a time marker. Yeah. So it's like a chemical clock. Exactly. That allows you to figure out how old they are. Noticing lots of these small xenophyophores around here. So those, this here, this is what we were talking about last night, those single cell foraminiferin protists. There's lots of different morphologies. Want a closer look that was the one that was in the sediments, right? Yep. And now we're finding them on the rocks. So uh, th they're not unsubstantial. Uh, Push in there for a sec, Tim. You know, p parts of the deep sea benthos, in, in oftentimes in, in the abyssal plain and these sedimented environments, uh, they can be the most substantial structure for miles and miles. And so they often aggregate all sorts of species that may live in, in and around them. Brittle stars may be associated with them, for example. Very poorly known diversity. It's also very hard to tell if they're alive or not. So oftentimes when these things are collected, you often need to get a lot of them because there's very little chance that it may be alive inside. Okay. But yeah, it's kind of what I was looking at. Can you circle this guy right here? Yeah, the Xenophyophore. This one looks not so fresh, so maybe possibly not living. What would be an indication of not freshness? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of um, what looks like uh, fouling, kind of fouling by other organisms. So there's, I don't know, it looks like a it's tiny crinoid or something right there. Um, or hydroid, it's tough to tell. But usually if they have very fresh sediment, okay. they may be more more alive. But it's again, it's very hard to tell. You know, they're single-celled animals, and you're only telling by the non-living part of their body, the shell, uh, or sediment house. You mentioned the word fouling. What does that mean? Just animals that grow on the outsides of other animals. You know, oftentimes uh, you know, we might refer to fouling in the way that other animals might colonize you know, bits of coral skeleton. Um, but just generally, you know, uh, the accumulation of other animals that, that use other surfaces for structure to attach. Oftentimes in sponges, it it is fouling, and you know, in, in terms of it is a, a negative on the sponge because it has a greater difficulty to perhaps pump water through its body. So it usually can, has a negative connotation, but not always. We've got 30 meters left on this ship move, and we just ran out of rocks. They'll come back. Yeah. We got a bit of slope left. Yeah. Sure do. Let me zoom out. I'm going to uh, oh. drop away. Back to here. this isotope analysis. Is potassium argon dating similar to argon argon dating? Um, I want to say yes, um, because you're doing the same or you're looking at the same type of um, isotopic decay, uh, right? Did they um, already drop the one so the on difference the is going to be the amount of the time between sure. getting the from the parent isotope to the daughter. Um, yeah, and so you can use different dating methods uh, oh, um, based on how old you think the rocks are. Because uh, some, like carbon-14, for example, that dating method doesn't work on anything that's super, super old, right? So you have to kind of play it by ear and figure it out as you go along.
Thank you for that bit of knowledge. We've got some uh, viewers that are into the dating, meaning argon, argon dating, <laughs> potassium argon dating and whatnot. When you have a sec, can we center up the camera? I'm going to drop a weight here, Steve. Okay. I was going to say Argon Argon. Sounds kind of like a Pokemon name or something. <laughs> I like it. What would its evolved form be? Uh, Argonius. <laughs> I'm sure some of these deep sea creatures can it like inspired Pokemon creatures for sure. <laughs> I've got questions about what just happened. What did we drop? Uh, we dropped some ballast and Alvin weight. Got it. So the ROV just dropped some, some weight. My ROV was sinking. Come on, somebody. What was it sinking about? That's what I was <laughs> going to say, but I thought <laughs> it, was it was too early that. for such jokes. <laughs> it was sinking. I'm happy, I'm happy. I keep sinking. <laughs> what was it what was it sinking about? <laughs> da -dum -dum -dum. Uh, We've gotten to that part of the dive. <laughs> <laughs> Barely an hour in. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Do the weights <laughs> dissolve? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so for those of you, I got quite a few questions coming in about the weights. Push it just um, a bit. Yeah. They dissolve. Completely. Yeah, I will just a second. They are uh, just mild steel weights. And uh, that's a uh, hemp rope that was tied onto it there. It's nothing worse than flying your ROV and thinking, oh, no one's ever been here and seen this before, and then you come across a, a rusty pile of Alvin weights. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. These weights dissolve in the environment, so they do not stay there forever. Okay, we've got about five meters left on this ship move. Do you want to stop and look around, or let's keep going for another? Keep going. All right, ROV. Yep. Bridge nav. We can add one zero zero meters to this bearing. No Thank sonar you. Questions coming in from Savannah, Georgia, sixth grade classroom. We could go a little faster if Steve's all right with it. How deep is Hercules right now, and how deep can Hercules go? It's the maximum. So I look over my shoulder here, Jordan. What does it say our current depth is? Current depth is uh, 2,073 meters. Steve, are you good with the speed, or do you want to pick it up a bit? What are we making up to? 0.2, or are we still? We're at, yeah. Well, uh, ship move just went in. We're out about 0 0.2 right now. Uh, a little higher, actually. Yep, yeah, we can uh, we can bump it up a Zero little bit. 0.3. But if we start seeing any uh, more relief, we'll bump it back down. Roger. Bridge nav. Did you uh, you made a note that we dropped. The can we increase speed to 0 0.3? Thank you. Steve, do you know the max depth that Herc usually can go at? I 4,000 meters. Uh, I think it's 4,000 meters, but the pilots probably have a better. <laughs> I heard you, Dan. I heard you. <laughs> what was that, Dan? I didn't hear. 4,000 meters. 4,000 meters. And what about uh, Argus? Argus is 6,000. Uh, most of the components on Hercules are rated to 6,000 meters. Uh, limiting factor is our uh, syntactic foam. Oh, that's buoyancy. important. <laughs> the foam syntactic. The, the buoyancy important. block, yeah. yeah. The yellow parts. The floaty bits. The part that helps you go up. It's uh, basically made with a 
epoxy resin and microspheres, glass microspheres that are common and uh, uh, used for uh, and, uh, airplanes. ROVs. ROVs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And depending on how uh, dense they they make that, uh, more more glass spheres versus epoxy is the depth rating of the of the buoyancy. So uh, it's a trade-off to get a six thousand meter uh, buoyancy. We would it would be a lot heavier, so Herc would probably be more like seven thousand pounds instead of five, which would require a bigger crane and more power. What is syntactic foam used for in planes? Uh, usually for uh, like doing repair, like in a in a car you use Bondo fiberglass, and it's so it's super light for airplanes. And that's where it comes from the aircraft and this. Huh, one. interesting. That's cool. I I didn't know that. It's kind of a cool thing. So there you have it, um, Savannah, Georgia, four thousand meters for Hercules and. Oh, I already forgot Argus. Six. I think they said 6,000. 6, yeah, 6,000 for Argus. Most of the parts of Hercules um, are rated to go up to 6,000, except for the syntactic foam, which is the colorful part of the robot. The uh, ROVs, the depth rating has gotten deeper and deeper over the years, like all the manufacturers that make the lights and the cameras and the sensors. They're making uh, 6,000 meter components now, which costs basically twice as much as a 4,000 meter component. So those are kind of the two uh, depths that you'll find ratings on. Uh, you're looking at jewelry, as we call it, for the vehicle, cameras, lights, sensors, navigation equipment. Those Did you say two ratings. it costs twice as much, but it doesn't go twice as deep? What's yeah. that all about? Um, they don't make as many of them, so the, uh. the common kind of depth rating for the commercial ROVs, you know, the Toyota ROVs of the world, are 4,000 meters. So they're making a lot of those, so production costs are lower. The 6,000 meter ones are less common, and there's more of the expensive bits like titanium. Uh, the connectors that we use that can withstand the, the pressure delta between the ambient pressure down here and the, and the one atmosphere and the housing have to be uh, rated for that extra pressure. So those are also more expensive. Makes sense. Yeah, they're, those, you know, it's not a huge production like an automobile uh, assembly where they're making millions of them. They're, like more in the hundreds or thousands. Or in our case, we call the vendor and say we want two. <laughs> <laughs> Supply and demand. Yeah, so they have to tool up and you know, custom built by hand while trying to maintain quality. More like a Ferrari versus a Toyota. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, I've been asked to introduce the ROV pilots in the first row, which I guess we haven't done this watch. If this is a good time, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a, a bit about uh, what you do. Well, since I was talking, I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the Herc chair. I sometimes get to operate, but mostly maintain the ROVs. I'm Antonella, sitting in the Argus seat. Um, yeah, same as Dan. A lot of the job is maintenance. Piloting is the fun reward. What's the main difference between Argus and Hercules in your positions when you're on a dive? Um. Hercules goes left and right, forward and backward. Argus goes up and down. So why do we need both ROVs? That question's... <laughs> that's a can of worms there. 
The two bunny system is common in the uh, research industry because uh, the biggest advantage for me is, uh, which I'm looking at every five seconds or so, is the view that is provided by Argus. So basically I have two ROVs, one is watching the other. So Antonella is, uh, has her hands full over there trying to maintain that uh, bird's eye view of Hercules. And it's really helpful to have two vehicles in the water because we can see where Herc is going and uh, what's kind of out ahead. So the view from Hercu Hercules is limited to maybe, you know, at the moment, Hercules can see three meters, maybe two meters. But Argus can see probably 50 meters out. So we know what's coming up. And it's really helpful to um, provide a a view from Hercules that's interesting to the scientists. We would, if we only had uh, one ROV, we would, you know, fly within three meters or four meters of really interesting targets and, and never know that we passed them. Do they ever help each other out? If there's a problem with one, can the other help? And that if there's a problem with either, how quickly can they be brought up to the surface? Yeah, so um, we've been tangled up a few times, and mostly in uh, uh, fishing line or, or mooring lines that that uh, get snagged on the bottom or left. Um, prawn traps and crab traps and uh, old anchor lines. And, uh, in that case, uh, we can bring Argus down for a, a closer view to see uh, where Hercules might be fouled up. Uh, make appropriate moves to, to rectify the situation. It really helps to manage the tether that's between Hercules and Argus with a single ROV. You'd have no idea where that tether's going except that two or three meter range that you have with the cameras on the ROV. And uh, Hercules can fly up and inspect Argus and look at it if it is having some issues. So they're buddies. They are. Yeah, basically we have two ROVs all the time and, and just one uh, deployment. For the single body system, you would have to have... Uh, Can we take a look right there? There's yeah, a small absolutely. stick. Cool little ledge. Oh, cool. You Did would have you? to have two winches, which would be huge. It's a big part of our system that you guys don't see. video they're asking if they could see what the scientists are circling um you can kind of see it in the van view in the upper monitor okay can push in there a bit i mean okay i thought this was something more substantial it looks to me like uh, some sort of Stock of something or other, light. probably covered with hydroids and uh, some other porch light coming on to me. Got it. Would that be biofouling? Yeah, some sort of yeah. recolonization <laughs> of an existing structure, maybe. All right, that's good. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Got about 13 meters left on this ship move. We can uh, slow back down or if you haven't already. Back in the rocks. Yeah, back down to point two. Sounds good. You want to just complete this move? We got ten meters left. Sure. So Sounds we good. Slow back down. Great. You want to put in another move after that, or spend some time looking around? Um. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, let's hold off on the move. Right see what's around here. We're at got a little time for two thousand meters. Vehicles to catch up to. Yeah. It's a stocked glass sponge down the bottom. That one looks really young, relatively speaking, or small. No real way of telling age visually.
we were having a discussion on the site about uh, the pro productivity of these areas is is quite poor um, Can you in the surface ocean. Just a little bit with Argus. Typically, uh, you know, we, we can judge, you know, kind of the product yeah, productivity of the water a by just a, little bit a lot of the yeah. stuff we see in the deep sea benthos. See. If um, if the waters in the surface ocean are quite productive, That's we often have thing. high densities of animals down deep uh, because all those big pulses of food get down there and able to support these deep sea benthic suspension feeding and. Uh, turn filter off, feeding uh, animals, if you want. but Black since we're not seeing a lot of sure. life here attached to the seafloor, e or even fishes for that matter, um, it's likely that this area is just very, very poor productivity area. Um, and you know, the oceanographically, that seems to be true uh, even though we are close to the equator or closer to the equator we're not within the highest productivity zones along the equator so there might be some food that's advected up from the equator and currents and such but uh, for the most part not much here so when you're saying productivity you mean like life yeah productivity as in biological yeah. activity a lot of the food webs down here are derived from the surface right no. surface food so photosynthesis right um, we're not talking about chemosynthetic habitats here all the energy is coming from the surface oh, tunicate there stock tunicate and the ship move is complete roger you want I think that's what those stocks were we were saying before Ooh. can we look up on top there what's that See the coral there in the crack? Oh, yep. I do. Which one do you want to see? Uh, on the one, uh, the crack one. Right. Yeah. I, I think they actually might be the same, but that, it's always, if, if my suspicion is correct, it's probably a, a precious coral, and they do this sometimes, and I can't understand why they'd grow in these really restrictive cracks and crevices, possibly because um, they, so bit, there's yeah. some sort of accelerated flow through these constraints. I'll try and land and you can uh, 4K oh, you that with one. with the 4K? Yeah. yeah. Let me try and land first before you zoom these in. On this dive, are we passing through or have we passed through an OMZ? Beautiful Argus view. That's that one. Probably on the way down. Oh, okay. Really yep. Cool. Uh, so you wanna zoom in? low oxygen here is uh, probably between five, 600 eating. meters. I can double check that. Got a sea spider in there too. Another spider. Just for Jordan. Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> this one seems Space to be a slow moving spider. Alright, gonna go in on the 4K. Yeah, so what we have here is a species of hemichorellium, a precious coral, an octocoral. Uh, along with a asteriskematid brittle star associate, looks like. Can we move the ship, Sam? 10 meters towards, move Argus 10 meters towards Hurt, please. Sure, 10 meters south, west. Yeah, right. These, uh, like I was saying before, these uh, precious corals, sometimes you'll find them in the cracks and crevices, and we don't quite understand why, but you can actually see the current seems to be Bridge coming. Now down slope here. So, you know, presumably when the water flows through this crevice, it accelerates a little bit and provides a good habitat for uh, this coral to feed in. So this is a hemichorallium. All right. Can I, zoom in on I suspect we'll see a lot more because we're starting to move up into the depth range where they're more common, you know, 2,000 meters and shallower. Thanks. At least in this part of the ocean. What's that b black blob? Urchin? It looks spiky. I'm going to say yes. Uh, I think that was an urchin. Yeah. Ooh, lots of ROV you questions. Push in there a little, Excuse tiny. Me. 
That's good, thanks. Try and get some light on it. Maybe uh, turn the porch light off now. Oh, that's a neat view in Argus. A little hovercraft. I'm gonna zoom in a little more. Looks like Any? our oxygen minimum here was uh, 20, 20, oh, actually six micromolar, quite low. Uh, around. Can uh, try and push in a bit more there? Yeah, 600 me. meters. We got a pretty good ID on this one, so whenever we're good with imagery, we can move on. You want to see the spider there? You got a sea spider? Another one? Sea yeah. spider. We've All got right. some sea spider fans right. that are there. viewing Ooh. as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah, this one looks like it's doing something. We're uh, moving Argus a little closer. So there you go. Getting a tug from it right now. Zoom out for me, Timmy. Thank you. And that ship move is complete. Thank you. Almost stopped. Okay, maybe you can push in on the spider now. Oh, it's it's eating something, huh? Yeah, so this is, uh, well, tough to tell. So we've got a few things going on here. Uh, so here's the proboscis, right? This is the mouth part. So it doesn't look like it's feeding on something directly, but we have up here, this is a hydroid, and it's got a couple of small amphipods on here too. Uh, but I don't think that's the target of the, the feeding right now. Um, I don't see anything that it's actually feeding on, but it is kind of curiously next to this uh, hydroid colony, so maybe maybe that's its next meal, possibly. <laughs> I've seen them feeding on solitary hydroids before, but nothing on this small. That, that is a large spider, I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> uh, Zoom out again. Right. It's not right. like the house I think we're all once. set with that. We'll continue on. Happy. Oops. Oi. Spiders. Nope. Do you want to nope. look at the uh, urchin area? We we saw that um, on the last watch, so I think we're right. satisfied with that. We're starting to see some curious ripples in the sediment here, which we hadn't seen a bit deeper, uh, which could indicate a kind of a different flow flow conditions, different flow regime at this depth. So hopefully, uh, the sign that we're seeing more of this. Uh, Suspension feeding organisms plus uh, these ripples could indicate that some of the observations are going to be a little bit better upslope. I think it's cool how the, like you're talking about the ripples and the flow, all of these give you clues to yeah. what you're about to see. Yep. And also, like this is my first time seeing these large exposed kind of volcanic rocks. Volcanic with an asterisk now because we're starting to move up into kind of a depth range where we don't know if these are volcanic materials yet. Sometimes we can suspect that, but you know, the, we're also moving up into, you know, a large carbonate platform, so we don't know, you know, if maybe they're big chunks of carbonate that broke off from up above and rolled downhill. Can you tell visually? I don't, not really. You know, it's typically you kind of have to collect a rock and cut it up. A huge thank you for the zoom in to the spider from the website. Thank you very much for that. We've got deep sea spider fans online. They're saying that they can get up to 20 inches. 
like half a meter across. Yeah. <laughs> what in the world? You okay, Dan? Can we zoom in on nope. this? Yeah, we can. We're gonna have nightmares and see spiders. <laughs> it's like a full shiver. <laughs> no, they're, they're all over the place here. Look at this. Yeah. Oh. Sneaking up on us. <laughs> I mean. I'll push in a little bit there. Tell me. If you Twenty know. inches. It's a trap. What what would you do if you saw, you saw a sea spider <laughs> entangled in the you know the wiring of Herc when you're doing your maintenance? I would have to, I would have to do the full on spider dance. <laughs> <laughs> Can you demonstrate that for us on camera? Yeah. <laughs> do a TikTok of it. <laughs> uh, I can try and center him up. To this might be a new species better. for the dive. That's why I want to get a look at this one. Yeah, let's see if I can center it up. To it's also the an opposite isopod over in the corner there. Looks like a sea spider, but it's not. From this far out, you can uh, tell, can like, we move the ship again? I've Another seen it before, I haven't. Sure Herc. can. Argus Sorry. Herc. When you zoom in, what yeah. are you looking for that lets you know this might be a different species than before? So, Is it color? Is it... It's a, it's a lot of different things, and... Uh, there's a, there's that minute an opposite isopod there keeps popping in. Yep, they're actually uh, they're swimmers. One six zero down. Uh, yeah. closer to Herc. Yeah, that way. great. Um, so with corals, you know, branching pattern, color to some degree can help distinguish large groups, different groups from each other. Uh, but when you Bridge zoom in enough. and we're getting really tight shots, I'm looking at polyp morphology and the shape of the polyps. Uh, uh, we have a step one zero meters. If there's a, any sclerites that are uh, present and visible, very zero. obvious. You know, sometimes we can get imagery on those. I suspect this is a primnoid, but I uh, will get a better view when we get it close in. Yeah, we're getting a tether tug, so I'm trying to find a marvel to balance on here. Okay, Tammy, it seems to be a zoomable spot there. I'm going to turn that porch light on and hopefully you can get a pull-up zoom there. Yep, this is a great shot for an overall. All right. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, is that full zoom there? That's what he wants to see. Oh, did you turn the porch light on? I did, but oh, I Oh, I was waiting for it and I didn't notice it, so. It, it might be blocked a bit. Yeah. We're just really close to it. See if I Tough to close. tell here. Uh, it's definitely a primnoid coral. I don't have a very good idea on this. Um, I suspect, based on kind of the number of plates I'm seeing, uh, so the sclerites and the body wall, the polyp, it's probably in the genus Norella. Um, but that's as far as I'm able to go right now. Can we grab a small snip of this, maybe a few centimeters? Sure. Uh, and slurp it up if you could. Right. And we've got. Two meters on a ship move. Roger. That full zoom, is it? Well, it's not right there. Sure is, sorry. I <laughs> and the ship move is complete. Thank you. Zoom out just a bit, I mean, to show the tip of it there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you.
So it, you'll notice when Dan touches this colony, um, the polyps will close up uh, kind of all at the same time. And how the polyps will close will tell us a little bit more about how uh, what this identity could be. So you're going to be looking at the colony's reaction. Yeah, yeah. So Dan, since this is so small, maybe a, you know maybe a third of it might be required. Right if you could get in that far. Think so. But we'll leave plenty to regrow here. So you'll see now, see how the polyps are starting to close. It looks like they're, uh, with the primnoids, they'll often be, um, the direction in which the polyp closes is called um, polyp polarization. Not too much there, Steve. Uh, I think that looks good. Yep. And depending on which way the polyps will close if it's down axis or up axis it tells us something about uh you know which species it could be so that these close that these polyps are closing down axis probably confirms that it's like nearly norella in the genus norella and then uh, it's the species okay, will be able to identify when we get a little bit uh when we get it up on deck and we can look at it under a microscope for example but just the the number of articulations and the number of plates uh, sclerites in the body wall of polyp suggests also norella. Great. Good capture. Good stow. All right, could go in. You haven't already. On there. Yes, what you're seeing in the main camera right now is the ROV's manipulator arm that just took a biological sample from a piece of coral. So it was able to cut a small piece off of that sample and it's going to Push be it just stowed a bit there if you want. in one of the spe specimen collection Zoom in a little tip. boxes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I think I'm ready for uh, 50%. That's 50. Right. There's some good parallax there, f there for you. You can see in bubble cam, I'm still light years away from it. Mm -hmm. How does that collection yep. system work, Steve? I, I see that he's got a piece and he's trying to, is it being placed in one of those collection devices? Is there a suction involved? In this case, yes, there's a suction. Yep. Is so it going in there? Uh, I think you're on it, yep. One way to, to use the slurp hose is to bring the slurp hose to, to the sample, but with a coral that wouldn't work because you have to cut it, right? To Zoom break the axis. So one method we use to save box space is snip and slurp. And so it'll go into a jar uh, via suction on the vehicle. You've got suction. So okay. there's snip and slurp, uh, and then there's slurp. Okay. 75. <laughs> 75. There it goes. It. I think you got it. Yeah. Another so question coming in is, is how much does the ch sample change once there it's it on the surface? How does it change on the surface? Yeah. 
once um, you bring it up, it's probably going to look a little different. They want to know about that. Yeah, it always looks smaller than you think, right? Because there's a magnification effect on the seafloor. But um, how, how do they physically change when they get to the surface? Oftentimes, we'll find um, that we're all set, Dan, here. We can move on when you're ready. Right. Good collection. Great. Want to zoom in there on that creepy thing? <laughs> Just while we're here. There's a there's a minopsid isopod over here too. If you want to look, sure. A little bit different. Go ahead, Timmy. So when they come up to the surface, that you might find that they'll probably look quite similar. But certain species, depending on what depth they come up at and how the temperature changes as we come up, uh, you know, they may start to decompose slightly uh, because we're talking about moving from a freezer to 30 degrees C. You know, potentially at the surface. It's warm up. It's warm outside. What's the other guy you were interested in, Steve? Uh, off to the left-hand side, there's a white-looking, long-legged thing. Go pull out just a bit, Tammy, for us. I'm sorry. These long-legged, spider-looking things are kind of creepy to me. <laughs> so, so with the minopsids, which is uh, what we're going to zoom over to over here on the left, far left. This is a minopsid isopod. Okay. And, uh, they are actually swimmers. They use their long legs to uh, kind of like, it's very awkward, you know, the way they move in the water, but they'll have small hairs and fibers on their, on their legs that they can use to actually maintain position in the water column. Really neat animal. These are isopods? Actually, yeah, it's an isopod. Wow. Yep. Is there a comparable animal on land, isopod? Roly polies. Really? There you go. Yep. Hmm. It's more like Tear a open a tree stump. Looks like an ant with long legs to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something charming about pycnogonids, but this one creeps me out. I don't know. This one's actually, I, we rarely see these on the seafloor, uh, but this is actually a really great imagery to get because oftentimes they're in the water column and it's hard to focus. Ah, uh, is that why they have two longer appendages? For floating? Yeah, they're for uh, yeah swimming. If you look at, you can see actually some of the arms, like this one, whoop, this one, they're kind of hairy. Yeah. Those actually provide some some purchased so it can start to swim with the water column. Did you call one of the arms hairy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can I see can't. slightly little bits of hair <laughs> on them. Well, it doesn't, are they legs or are they kind of an antenna or feelers? Yeah, the ones up top here, these are, look like they're yeah. antenna, but the legs also, hard to see. Interesting. And comparable to a roly-poly on land. All right, we're okay. good back here. Full wide, please. Cool. Learn something new every day. No idea where my camera is. Ah, there it is. If we weren't I in the protected area, that that, that would have potentially been a collection candidate too, because it's rare that they. They're just sitting on the bottom. Interesting. Steve, what about the orange uh, on the rock? I think orange spongy looking. Yeah, it looks, I think that's just oxidation. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's quite bright. We haven't seen very many sponges at this depth that are pigmented. Hmm. Mostly just the glass sponges. But you'll, you'll off, you know, if there's exposed rock they oxidize and they turn yellowish red all the time some of the rocks we collected last night uh, not on our watch but others um, have a bunch of this oxidation reddish orange really well. well we'll be able to see when they come up what causes the color is that like it's rust iron oh, yeah <laughs> so does that suggest not a not a carbonate um, or can't tell 
I'm going to defer to the geologist. There we go. Mike, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like it would likely mean that it was more basaltic, you know, because um, those rocks tend to have a lot more iron in them than carbonates, right? So carbonates are, you know, calcium carbonate. <laughs> Um, and we still might be a little too deep to see a lot of that influence, I think. So we're saying volcanic rock, maybe? Couple meters yep. Yeah, possibly. Um, Five if you got it. You get a lot of weathering and alteration on those yeah. as well. Um, and so you can sometimes have that rust persisting on the outside of the rock. Um, but once you cut into it, you may see that there's an alteration ring or rim around it, um, and you have fresher stuff still inside. I see the guy on top there, Steve? Yeah, I think it's the same coral we just sampled. You want a close-up of it, do you? Uh, we don't need to. It looks similar enough, unless you're just waiting around here if you want something to zoom on. No, I'm just uh, moving up the uh, feature here. Yeah, would we like another ship move, or? Yeah, let's Great. keep going. Dan, good to go? Yeah, Reg. Going in. Bridge nav. Still moving north, I'm thinking. These spider comments. At least you don't accidentally uh, eat a one zero zero spider meters bearing zero sleep. one one. <laughs> They're too far away. Ooh, I yes, can't Dan, half a one meter. One. Half Better. a meter. <laughs> they, they they're very strange. I've I've held one before a few times. They're they're chitinous, right? They have this kind of like cuticle um, so they're they're somewhat flexible um, but yeah they just they're really weird there's th they uh, so these are the kind of giant ones um, but they they're often sea spiders are often much smaller you can even find them scuba diving sometimes in certain parts of the west coast east coast um, are the giant ones found in colder waters Antarctica also yeah yeah same okay. genus probably Colossendius. There's your uh, that same coral in uh, 4K there. You wanna yeah, let's, uh, I think this might be different. Let's take a look. Can't quite tell. Can you put it in the HD frame? It's, just, it's a little hot. I can't see the. It's not a lot of contrast. Uh, let me turn off the light here. How about now? Oh. Yeah. It's, uh, can you do a HD zoom? Because I I can't get that yeah, close. Yeah. So I can only see over your shoulder here. <laughs> Go ahead, Sammy. <laughs> We can put it up on that big screen too, on that one if yeah. you want. So this, um, yeah, this is the same. Yeah, uh, actually, no, this is a different genus of primnoid. This is uh, this is actually Candidella, Candidella gigantea. It's one of the few species we can identify pretty readily. So. Candidella has very high polyp density, but also it has lots and lots and lots of these plate-like sclerites in the body wall. That's that's a fantastic image. Um, so they're kind of like overlapping scales, plates. So this this is a different uh, genus and diff different species. This is Candidella gigantea, known hmm. from this part of the Pacific. Great, fantastic, like super great imagery. Yeah, you can see the sclerites very clear. But we know this one. We've collected a lot in this area, so um, no collections needed. All right. Very good, though. Great. Super great. Super great. Super, Super great. great. Check, check. <laughs> Double check. <laughs> Super great. Watch. <laughs> you got all is, sorts is that, of names. Is that our name yeah. now? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I think we'll have a, a vote. I'm going a smidgen in on Argus. 
just past that glare. Oh. Watch good. name Arachnophobes. That's a nice, that's a nice <laughs> view in Argus there. Well, that's a suggestion from the web there. <laughs> Arachnophobes. <laughs> you could actually drop down. Three Picnic on iPhones. Phobes. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, Delta Dan. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you maintain that double digit altitude, I don't think we're in. And we're not heaving yeah. four <laughs> meters up and down. Here, here's a band name for you Delta Dan and the Arachno Arachnophobe <laughs> <laughs> Band. <laughs> Delta Dan and the Arachnophobe Band. Yeah. That could work. Didn't we already come up with some like band songs? What was the name of that choral that sounded like the name of a, I don't know, a, cu a country, uh, country ballad? Uh, <laughs> you remember right. that, Jordan? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm really curious. Something in the top of the crack there. I can't. I call dibs. I'm playing the washboard. <laughs> I get the cowbell. <laughs> you always need more cowbell. What I need is more cowbell. <laughs> Got about 70 meters on the ship move, right. but happy to stop anytime. Question for our geologist: Do we ever find any crystals down at this depth? So, when we cut open um, these rocks, sometimes we can see and hand sample um, the minerals that are actually in there. So you can get some olivine crystals from basalts. Um, you can also see plagioclase sometimes. Um, as for something like, I don't know, a quartz crystal, which I assume is probably what um, the question is asking. I don't know. I don't think those are as common, especially at these depths, right? So we tend to find smaller mineral crystals inside of these rocks. Thank you. So the answer is yes, with the qualifier, it's yeah. the smaller ones. Definitely seen crystal-like formations in the inside of hydrothermal vent chimneys. Oh, but yeah. as not a geologist, I don't know what the, the minerals are, but they're certainly very pretty. You know, I'm a, uh, oh, relicanthus, there we go. Ooh. Type of anemone. Well, actually, it's related to anemones. It's actually not an anemone, technically. It's a different group entirely. Oh, are these the super ancient ones? Yeah, they're a very, very ancient lineage. They saw they saw one um, just after we got off watch last night Person around uh, nine o'clock. Is this different than the one that we saw in the sediment? Yes. Yeah. This that that was a cerianthid. This is a relicanthus. It's a. Uh, I think it's a, a entirely different order. Taxonomic order, that is. We can uh, get closer view if you want, Steve. Uh, no, that's pretty good. We They saw this last night. This is also one of those things that is not really well known from this area, and um, all of what we know about it uh, are from uh, species that were collected at hydrothermal vents. Um, so we don't really know which species they are. These are we know that they're probably in the genus Relicanthus, but you know, without being able to collect a whole animal, we're not able to know much more about it than that. What makes the spider web there in the center of the camera? Oh, one of the great eternal mysteries. What makes the mucus houses? Nobody, <laughs> nobody really knows. Really? Really? No, I mean it, it's it, yeah, it's it's a mystery. Um, they're very hard to collect, but yeah, I'm not sure which animals create these kind of web mucus houses. Hmm. I want to know. <laughs> I do also. I want the answer to that mystery. Okay. Looks like a spider web in a rock crevice. Thank you. So is mystery mucus houses also a band option? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think that's a hit single. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. 
I don't know if that's a good band name or just plain gross. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery mucus. Got a <laughs> classroom shout out to the New Kent Oceanography class joining us online. Thank you so much for watching. Um, they're curious as to how long we've been out here and how long do we plan to stay out here? I'm going to ask somebody else to answer because I'm currently living in some sort of time warp. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to. I, I was going to say a week, but I think I said that at the last watch. Yeah, it's as of today, it's eight days now. We've been out here eight days, and we're going to be out here for at least eight more. That's right. Before heading heading back toward, uh, toward land. Bigger, land bigger land. Bigger land is a myth. <laughs> bigger land. Bigger land, yeah. Land that I'll, we'll be able to get off and walk on. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can actually leave the ship this time, right? Mm -hmm. Hypothetically. Got about 25 meters left on this move. Roger. Do geodes form down here? I know elementary school classes all over the world open up geodes <laughs> and study geodes, so they're curious. What do geodes look like? Um, can we find geodes down here, and what do they look like? I don't actually know if you can find geodes um, in the deep sea, but typically when you find them, you know, on land, or, you know, the ones that you get in the classroom, they look more rounded, um, sometimes lighter in color on the outside. Can you change and then when the you ship bearing bust them open, my bearing you never know what yep. you're going to get, right? Feature. So there are a bunch of really cool colors. Um, different minerals that you can get out of them. Yeah. Or just do I a think step they were over. inspired by the, sure. the the mystery comments, like a geode, you never know what's going to mm. be inside. Yep. You know, if, if we were in a bit of a different oceanographic environment, I would expect this entire ledge right here to be covered with corals and things, sponges. Yeah. But curious, it's, it's not. Uh, it is curious. Can we zoom in on this... Uh, Denuded stock there. Yeah, Roger. Right. Why don't you stop him, Sam, and do yeah. a step and bring Argus 10 meters closer? Bridge, to no? Look, this is the. The whole position? This is really nice habitat now we're getting to. This is the kind of stuff I was expecting to see for the whole dive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we arrived! Yay! Yeah. So, actually, th I think that's exactly what this is. It's a, it's a denuded stock of a stocked crinoid. I saw one a bit deeper as well, but the, the crinoid would be down to and really it at, over. The, at the end of that thing. Down and over? Sure. Okay. You might have to wait for a ship move, Steve. We're tight, tight that's, on Argus here. That's fine. Whatever you can do. It doesn't have to be a, a tight zoom. It can just be a partial. Yeah, go ahead, Timmy. Bridge, Nav. Yep. So this is a crinoid stock with the, the crinoid missing. But sometimes they're able to regrow depending on what kind of material is left behind. But yeah, crinoid stock. Okay, good, thanks. All set. Uh, one zero meters bearing trying to get uh, Argus a little closer to her care. We're a bit stretched out. Three choices here, Steve. Any of them interesting? Yeah. Um, so I know what the these stocked crinoids are already. That's a species called Proisocrinus ruberimus. Um, the precious coral, though, down in the bottom might be a candidate for a quick zoom. Roger. And then I, I'm thinking also in a, in a few minutes, uh, well, before we leave this rock, to maybe do a eDNA collection uh, 
Niskin sample right in this area, just just to test since we haven't taken very many. Uh, am I pulling you, Antonelle? Um, yeah. You want to spin around? Sure. Wanna Steve, after we check this uh, like coral out, moves. do you mind sharing a little bit more about eDNA? If we're going to take a sample, okay, I think that'd be cool to share with the people sure. online. Or just take your auto heading off. Okay. So what Actually, what we've got here oh, looks like a bubblegum coral. Uh, I thought it was a precious coral, but it's actually, a, looks like a species of Paragorgia. Oh, and a Stoloniferin. Actually, two types of corals here. I'm fighting Argus there, so it's a bit... Is the ship still there. moving? Then? Ship's still moving, just about complete. Do we want another 10 meter step? Uh, sure. yeah. Whatever Dan needs to get stable. Bridge nav. Yeah, we're. Let's do uh, another Antonella's one zero uh, meter step, bearing two two five. Spun around to look away, I think. We're tail to tail now Got to one get of those the forams over there too. Right here. Yeah. That's actually a coral. Really. Yep. Now on the rock, um, you get these. Uh, small corals called stoloniferins. They um, they grow kind of in ribbons along the rock. But yep, those are in each individual polyps. I'm gonna. I can get a floating zoom here, Steve. We'll have to wait till Argus gets closer to get stable. That's all right. Yep. And then we have time. What about that guy right there to the left? of the coral down this one yeah so that that's a that's an old uh, hold fast i think probably a base of an old coral colony it looks like it's broken off and probably been you know, when when they look you know white and fresh you know usually it might have been recent but um, oftentimes the when they're discolored it's probably been there for a very long for a time while. yeah so it could be either from you know where these one of these critters attached or it could be from a coral not clear. How do they attach? Corals? Uh, so most of the time, uh, it depends on the, the specific way they attach, depends on different types of, uh, d you know, their taxonomy a little bit, how, you know, which group of corals they belong to. Most of the time, the polyp will plant itself down and start calcifying a little bit. Sometimes the the mineral they use at the base can actually be different than, than the mineral they use in the skeleton, like the, the branches, which is really interesting. We'll come back to that one, Steve. I'm going to yep. move to the north just a little bit here where we could find something to look at to the north, sure. and then we can slide back to the south. So. Got three meters left on the ship move. Yeah, we're is way, it way out of the box at the moment. Captain. So this ridge is... Uh, kind of not oriented as no, you'd expect, we, right? We changed our uh, bearing to try and match it. You can see uh, Herc's bearing there. It's kind of, gotcha. I don't know, 030-ish. Zero zero yep. You got another step or settle? Yeah, yeah let's do a step that, that way. way. So yeah, the, they, you know, the larvae will land in the spot. Bridge, yeah. You know, start calcifying, and you know, usually it'll start as you know one or two polyps, and they'll just grow uh, over time and just we have another step, lay down layers of bearing, uh, uh, one calcium three, carbonate, one three five minerals, and grow up. There's some really interesting work being done about, at least it has been done in the past about microbial biofilms, and you know, maybe. Um, priming Probably an area for coral settlement, meters, but yeah. it's not really well known uh, if those kinds of biofilms or even Bridge microbes up. more generally um, might influence where a larger Can animal one could five settle. Meters total? How long are we talking about getting to some of the larger corals that you see? And just the gro growth rate? Growth rates are variable as far as we know. Um, and it depends on kind of the the food inputs to a to an area. So out here, You're where it's very um, 
nutrient poor in the surface ocean and we don't have yeah, a lot of carbon getting down to the seafloor, no, growth rates are probably going to be slower than, uh, say, North in okay. a, yeah. a higher productivity upwelling zone, for example. Um, so things gr could be growing here on the order of you know, millimeters to maybe a centimeter uh, per year or every few years. Um, it depends on different species as well. Um, I think you're probably talking, you know, centimeters per per decade more on that life um, life history than something that's faster. So very, very, very slow. You might be able to spin around Given now. Given that slow growth rate, question coming in from the viewers: What are the largest animals that we find in these type of areas? I I think they're talking about the invertebrates, so. Uh. Yeah, they are, uh, for sure. Um, actually, hold on a second. Uh, Dan, in, in this general area, if you want to hold here and pop a NISC and we can do that before we settle up on something. Yeah, we can. Yeah, un until you're in a good place, that is. Because we've got... Uh, I can pop a NISC now. We're still waiting to get Argus closer to Herc. We're, we're still tail to tail. Yeah, you, you can do it now in here, um, you know, a couple meters off the wall if, if that's comfortable for you. Yep. We got four meters left on the chip move. So looks like we're about to take a water sample. Ship has moved, but uh, Argus has not. Just starting to move. Yep. Yeah, so um, what we're going to do here is kind of maintain close proximity to this diversity of corals that we're finding here um, in uh, an attempt to capture some of the environmental DNA that's in the water column. So this is free floating, um, you know, mucus or, uh, you know, bits of tissue or maybe uh, fecal material that's in the water that has passed through or comes from these animals. And when we get that water back to the surface, we're going to filter it and preserve the, the filtered material. Um, in a, a type of DNA preservative uh, so that we can try and sequence some of the DNA that's present in the environment around here. Uh, can you go full wide? That's kind of the basic principle behind e eDNA. Do you want to, uh, is this close enough, Steve, or do you want me to spin uh, this yeah, what, to the Yeah, how far off are we? A couple meters? I am uh, four meters. Right, the right. front of Herc is about four and a half meters from the wall. Yeah. I I think that's okay. Yeah, let's just do it here. I, can, what we find. I can get closer if you want. If you if you can get closer, if it's not too much. Uh, absolutely. Too this much of a problem. number five is available. Um, right there. Yeah. We've only taken one though so far, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what sample number will this be? This will be uh, sample 15. Thanks. You want to be two meters from the wall, do you? So on channel three right now, if you're watching the quad, you should see our Niskin rack on the port side of Herc, uh, along with all the bottles that are uh, open right now. And in a couple seconds, we're going to pull a trigger that's going to close one of those bottles, capture about five liters of water uh, from this depth and hold it so it doesn't mix with any other water as we go up. And then we'll uh, be able to remove that water when we get to the surface. I'm about uh, two meters from the wall now. You're happy with that? You can see it there in uh, Argus. It's okay, Steve? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, let's do uh, it. You said Niskin 5, right? Yeah, Niskin 5. Niskin 5 appears to be the orange pole. Does that, does that look right to you guys? Looks, yeah, it looks right. Yeah. Will the water sample only be used for environmental DNA, or are there other things that scientists will want to pull huh? out of this water sample? Four. Right now, we are, oh uh, on yeah. this particular cruise, we're only prepared Niskin to take the eDNA the sample one? from the water, but we've yeah. also done other experiments. Yeah. Uh, looking at Thank different you. things in the water, from metals to carbonate chemistry. 
Okay, desk in five. You got it. There it goes. Oh. Thank you. What's with the uh, viewers want to know, what's the white sediment? that looks like it's leaking out of the rocks. What is that? My thought is it's just the sediment, but I'm not quite sure. Ship move complete. Uh, um, What's up? They want to know about the white Artist stuff on the rocks. Oh. I'm saying it's yeah. sediment. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, sediment. it's just sediment. <laughs> Okay, tell me a good question just a bit there. Um, I have enough leash to uh, look at items here. We're still waiting for Argus to swing in. So I want a close up of this guy, for example. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay, tell me, go ahead. So this is a type of precious coral, a relative of the bubblegum coral we just saw. But this is actually probably the same species as the one we saw in the crevice. Uh, so this is a precious coral in the genus Hemichorellium. These are very, very fragile species. Um, you can see it looks, it doesn't look whole. It looks like it's had a number of branches possibly fallen off. Uh, they typically grow in kind of a symmetrical manner, but uh, it looks, this one looks like it's had some damage, but probably regrown uh, over the past, uh, over its lifespan. Great, great shot. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that's good enough. If you, uh, we still want to go back to the south and fight. Back to the bubblegum coral there. Uh, the Paragordia, whatever it yeah, was. It, yeah, how far off are you from that? It's not very far. Okay. And Steve, what distinguishes a coral as precious? Ten, Sam, on the same, uh, it's a, it, it's a common, whatever it's a common name. It's it doesn't really refer t to, um, anything you know taxonomically. It, it just refers to the fact that in the past they've been. Uh, uh, treated as, um, you know, material that jewelry can be made out of in their history. Certain species, uh, for example, like Corallium, Mediterranean, have been exploited in the past you, uh, open the uh, for, you know, the zero. kind of hard mineral that they produce. Sorry, I was turning it the uh, wrong but way. But these yeah. are, are very, very <laughs> faint and very fragile enough that... Um, there's really not much to do there, but they do produce a hard, three things right uh, now. very fragile skeleton too that could be used in that manner. It's just it's not economically viable uh, for a lot of the deep water species. I think this is it here. It's a very yeah interesting history. Corallium rubrum in the going back to the you know, ancient history. I think you can come uh, down. Was exploited throughout the Mediterranean meters, for its gemstone-like properties. Uh, but same thing with uh, black corals to some degree. A lot of black corals have been exploited by humans in history to uh, you know, use that material as you know, gemstone or jewelry-like material. But um, you know, only the shallow, shallow living relatives, not the the deeper species. Ship move halfway through. Right, uh, it should be good for another five, I think. Add another five? Uh, no, and no. now should be good for another five down. Yep, Great. I'm coming down. That still leave you double digits underneath, does it? Yeah. All right. Perfect. We'll see how Argus does, but... I'd like to, in the end, be about 10 meters away from Herc. Okay. 
10 or 15, something like okay. that. Can I see the, those two packets there? Thanks. So this is just going to be a, a visual. We collected this during uh, our past explorations of this area at a little bit shallower depth, 1,700 meters, but um, good to just get a visual confirmation, Paragorgia. NA-110-006. Steve, did you just cite the previous sample number? Yes. Wow. Got got my got okay. my packet. <laughs> if it bounces a little. I knew it would be worth to print these out. It's okay. Yeah. If you pull up right now, it'll it'll pull me off the rock. Okay. The tether is hitting Argus. Yeah. It's, I'll live with that while we get the shot here, because okay. I'm still getting the telegraph on those uh, heaves. Okay, Tammy, try that. It's not the greatest angle, but uh, push it. I can't really zoom right now. I'm having issues with the recorders. That's all right. We can move on, Dan. We got, we got a good idea on this, and we have a specimen from a previous year, so right we're all set. And that ship move is complete. I, I do think it's a good idea to kind of track this ledge, though, as we go up. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the idea. I'm still kind of waiting for Argus to settle out. And then uh, we'll figure out what the bearing of the of the feature is for the next uh, vessel move. Got it. Someone asked how much bottom time is left today. We start at. Around 9.30 yesterday morning. And this is a 24-hour dive, so I'm planning to go to about mid-morning again today, so probably just a couple more hours, maybe another four hours or so. Yeah, what are we up to local time now? Got it's now 6.17. 6 6.30, yep. Hawaii time. Are you good, Tammy? Nope. Do you want us to hang out and wait? Are they? Uh, yeah, possible. Both my recorders just completely froze, so. Isn't that a band saying, are, <laughs> are we recording? <laughs> Check one, two. Should be a guitar riff in the background. <laughs> Okay, you can proceed. I got one going on both cameras for right now. Are we good for a quick zoom while we're parked sure, here? Sure, I can do that quick for you. That's great. All right, thanks very much. Zooming back out. It's really pretty. So Argus is finally in a happy spot there. That's a, a nice offset if the feature continues that way. And I'll just uh, square up on it. Great. See if that's the case. Oh uh, well. Square up with the uh, mesotech should give us an idea there. Okay. 
Steve, anything else you want to do in this area or continue nope. along the ledge? Track up along the ledge, yeah. Along the ledge. Dan, let me know when you're ready. Uh, I'm ready. I'm just trying to get a wait for the scan to come around. Where's my scan reverse action? Actually, I'll let you get turned uh, so I can also figure out where this ledge is. I think it's going to be minus 90 from... No. It's weird. Yeah, roughly minus 90 from this heading. Okay. So, uh, here... What's my heading now? Um, I know that number's here somewhere. Like in a decimal. Oh. <laughs> uh, 120 minus 90. 120 minus 90. Gotta do some math. I failed at 30. There, so otherwise, I'd help you. Let's <laughs> do 30. Too hurdy. <laughs> oh. Always a good poly joke. Okay. Zero three zero then. Bridge nav. One zero zero meters bearing zero three zero, please. Uh, standby bridge. You want to keep a zero point three? Uh, sure. Or maybe you want to slow go slower, Steve? No, that's fine. Of what we were doing before. Right. Yeah. What we, what was it? Point two, right? Uh, yeah. We, were, we can do point two. What, what were we doing before? We had bumped up to 0 0.3 when okay. it was over the sediment, but we can slow down. Yeah, let's, long let's slow down to okay. point 0.2 again, yeah. Bridge, we can move to 0 0.2 knots. Actually, Dan, I got Thanks. another uh, target for you to zoom in on right here. Sure. It's kind of triangular fan-shaped. Ship move underway. All right. Tammy, are you in a zoomable mode over there? Yeah, I can zoom for you. Thank you. All right, so this is a golden coral. This is a Pleurogorgia militaris, pretty sure. We did see this a bit deeper, but never in the middle. It's always, you know, either it's a very deep dwelling, like wide depth range species, or possibly two different species, but I'm pretty sure this is Pleurogorgia militaris. Uh, pretty pretty clearly, clear to identify in this area. Pretty well known. You happy with that, Steve, or you want some more? Imagery? Very, yep, very. Moving on. Good to document what's here so that we know, um, you know, what to look for in our eDNA sample. About how often on these dives do you come across something new? Like, oh, I've never seen that before. Uh, it depends on kind of where the, what depth range we're diving at. Um, I think Can you, uh, I was open the, a little bit the deeper so. part of the dive, you know, when we first got on bottom, we saw that big boulder covered a lot of biology. Video. Like that was pretty new. So I, I wouldn't, I would Thank say you. at least a few times per dive, you know, especially in depth ranges where we haven't been very, um, haven't been very explored before. But a lot of the species in this depth range, uh, this depth range, you know, between 2,500 meters up to maybe 1,500 meters or even 1,000 meters is pretty well explored in the Central Pacific. Uh, so you find species that are similar or reminiscent to ones you can identify. Uh, but that said, there's also many that we can't. Um, so it's good to keep zooming and getting collections where appropriate uh, so that we can m most accurately characterize the diversity of this assemblage. That one looks like an encrusting sponge right there, maybe. But those encrusting sponges are very difficult to identify, let alone sample. They often come up 
mutilated. Uh, you kind of have to get it while it's on a rock uh, or kind of slurp it up. But even when you slurp it up, they usually come up pretty mangled. Do you want a close-up, Steve, or just keep on? Just keep going. Right there. Yeah. The peach is getting big enough where we can kind of decide whether we want to be on the top where. Yeah, let's let's head up towards the top of it. No cup corals. No cup corals, you said? No, I haven't seen any of you. I or I haven't you? seen very many either. I thought I saw one down deeper, but the xenophyophores are uh, <laughs> sometimes very cup coral shaped, and they're a little confusing, but. No, I haven't seen ones that I'm very obvious are cup corals yet. But we're we're moving up into the depth layer where you know these are kind of easily recognizable, widely ranging species. You can probably find the same species here as you would in Hawaii or the Northwest Hawaiian Islands or even Johnston Atoll, maybe even Howland and Baker. So these are this. This depth range has very wide ranging species. Geographically, not necessarily bathymetrically, you know, but geographically. But we're also coming into an area where you, the, the, this rock has a very, you know, very kind of round, you know, smooth, and it looks very crusty. Uh, type of substrate and uh, hopefully some of our rock collections can tell us if you know these these areas might be enriched crusts or you know maybe even thickness of crusts depending on uh, how the rocks are cut up But you can see that here all the suspension feeders are kind of right in this band here. It seems to indicate that the flow conditions are favorable for, you know, this, you know, just below the, the crest of this ridge uh, for, for filter feeding and particle capture. I'm going to try and get to the north of you a little bit, Antonella. So. Oh, watch out for that cliff. better you know what I haven't seen yet which I'm very surprised about are the uh, pelagic sea cucumbers we often see them in this area um, at, you know at or near the bottom these uh, pelagothuria species haven't seen a single one in some years we see dozens and dozens is it just to the area that it, 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 this is the latitude where we typically find them. I just think uh, maybe this site might not have the conditions where we find them. But usually we'll f see them on the ascent or descent, at least a few, but I haven't seen even that on the ascent or descent yet. What makes them different from uh, other sea cucumbers that we've seen so far? The, so there, there are lots of different types of sea cucumbers. There are like the swimming ones that live on the seafloor uh, yeah, they eat on the seafloor. The Pelagothuria species is the only sea cucumber that, to the best of our knowledge, doesn't use the seafloor environment at all in its life to feed, reproduce, whatever. Um, so it lives entirely in the water column. But occasionally you'll see them you know, drift down over time. Sixty meters left on this ship move. Yeah. Looks like my bearing is more. Uh, you want me to go more north? Yeah, I think so. Roger. According to that, it was. Uh, 
like 015. No, just 015. What's the ship's bearing right now? Uh, 030. Yeah, that sounds 015-ish. Okay. Fish there. Keep Bridge now. Off the, off the cliff. Can we change our bearing to 015? Something there you want to see, nope, Steve? No, I'm just noting it for the Thank scientists you. ashore and logging the fish. Okay, thank you. Or relicanthus, anemones. So it's getting pretty vertical pretty fast here. Yeah, I'm just going to come up a bit so we can uh, peek over the top a little bit. Yep. There we are. This is kind of uh, strange. It's it's what I expected this slope to be like. This was the most intense slope of the entire dive track. But I was very surprised when we were stuck in the sediment for so long. So Rebecca, the question asked is, what sort of geological formation are we looking at currently? Um, so it's probably an old lava flow. Um, you could tell earlier on in the dive, there were some pillow features, some tubes, like lava tube looking like features. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what we expect for the seamounts in this area. Hopefully we'll find like a pile of float or something eventually to pick up another loose rock from. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. We will. We can break one off. <laughs> we'll find <laughs> something. There's one right there. Yeah. <laughs> break me, break me. You think you're gonna break that off? Yeah, good try. It. Sounded like a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the right size. It is. And it's uh, definitely has a known place. I don't know if that's a lot of sediment on top. I don't know if you're going to find much better in this type of environment. But if you think you can break it off, we can go for it. Yeah. Okay, give it a shot. Okay. Bridge nav. Hold position. <laughs> a challenge has been issued. <laughs> I uh, I take that very seriously when you say <laughs> you think you can break it off. Grip force. That's nine. <laughs> this is how the great stories start. <laughs> <laughs> Turning it up to grip force nine. Sounds like another hit song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a candidate for uh, for starboard larboard there. Oh. Grip Force 9. Grip Force 9. <laughs> Lost control of the vehicle for a minute. Or the uh, the special sampling team we call when things get tough. Where'd it go? What's that? The vehicle went on a holiday there. Is that the auto depth issue? Mm. The auto out? Yeah. It's stays about. If you have to bail, it's okay. We'll find something else, but I'm curious soon, how hard this stuff is. As soon as I grab on, it should uh, anchor the should vehicle with the manipulator. Yeah. First I was afraid, then I had Grip Force 9. <laughs> <laughs> the wheels are turning. I can, I can see yeah, it. I know. I can see it in your head <laughs> right good. now. mark on it but it did look like a good candidate you think having the other jaw on there would help 
the other let's get closer one more try I'm gonna cry uncle that's the grip we want it Such a fascinating process to see here and watch. Sometimes the underhanging ones, you touch them and they fall off, and sometimes you grab them three times and they resist. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good shot. Hmm, the one that got away. Now I really have to write a song about it. <laughs> Do we want to keep moving or look around for another rock? Yes, keep moving. Keep moving. Bridge nav. I'm going to. Uh, one zero zero meters bearing zero one five, please. Pop back up to the top there. Okay. But actually, uh, or we can go down. They might have sampled a cup coral earlier. Cup coral. Yep. Really? Yeah, they did. They slurped it. Slurped it. Awesome. They old scrape and slurp. Yep. Oh, look at that rock. It's got to be useful. Ship move underway. Beautiful. Right. You bring your head left just a couple degrees for us. It's pretty crusty. Yeah. These are definitely that one you want to see there, Steve. Pillows. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Let's do a quick zoom in image. Yeah, you can push in a bit there, Tammy. Black coral here, probably bathypathies also. Push in a bit more if you want. Mm -hmm. That's all right, we don't have to stick around there. Sometimes you find a marble to balance on, sometimes you don't. That's a knot. So, I want to change her bearing to Zero, 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 five. These types of rocks can be very deceptive. They look like they're all loose, but they're often Bridge like nap. one big concretion underneath. Yeah, the sediment hides a lot. Can we change our bearing to zero, zero, zero? Okay to redo the step. Sometimes if we want a rock like that, it'll bring down a crowbar, or you can like get some purchase on it and maybe pry it off. The crust actually isn't very strong. The rock is, but the crust is... It's pretty fairly it's so brittle. Delicate, yeah.
coming up a bit. I'm coming up. I'm, I'm coming up. So Steve, this question asks, why has the O2 saturation and concentration gone down since we've ascended? So, great question. Um, so, in this area, there is an oxygen minimum zone at around 600 meters, uh, and the deep waters are actually uh, more well oxygenated than that layer. So, as we move shallower, oxygen levels will go down until we get to about 600 meters. Then they'll It'll be quite low, about six micromolar, and then they'll increase again, uh, shallower than that depth. The oxygen minimum zone is kind of a product between um, just the oceanographic conditions in the area and also uh, the degradation of organic carbon as it sinks down from the surface. Just Microbes just act upon it and consume uh, oxygen in the water column, and most okay. of that activity tends to occur um, it t tends to promote this band of low oxygen at around 600 meters in this area. But oxygen minimum zones, I know, technically, according to the, the most, um, you know, the textbook definition of the term, um, which there's some disagreement about as well, oxygen minimum zones don't necessarily occur in this area, uh, but, you know, we can call them areas of low oxygen or zones of low oxygen. Most of the time, oxygen minimum zones are, are um, restricted to areas around um, continental margins that are subject to high upwelling uh, and productivity, uh, where there's a more significant oxygen drawdown than in the open ocean here. So that's why oxygen is going down as we ascend mm -hmm. to a point. Another maybe Syrianthid anemone down there. Some kind of anemone. Change her bearing again to uh, three, four, five. Three, four, five. All right, it's curving around on us. Sorry. It's kind of. Yeah, curving. Bridge nav. Can we change our bearing to three, four, five? Okay to redo the step. One of the things that I was remarking about um, while trying to put together this cruise plan was uh, you know, what what kinds of things might we find where, um, and you know, based on what we had seen in the past uh, in this area in 2019, um, there were some pretty low densities of animals um, throughout this region, um, you know, in, in the immediate vicinity of the monument. Um, I was hoping, as we visited kind of the northern sites that we got weathered out of, uh, that there would be some sort of uh, gradient, you know, maybe some higher densities of animals further north, uh, and then and as we got further south, uh, you know, it would become more like this, because uh, this is kind of the environment we were seeing in 2019. It was really kind of not as abundant. Uh, life on the seafloor as we hoped. Occasionally we, we would come into patches of high density precious corals, but it really wasn't much there. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure kind of what's driving this. You know, I we hypothesize that it's the low productivity of the surface waters, but you know, it could also be things like um, instability in the substrate. So the rock, you know, for a coral or a sponge that's going to be slow growing, you know, the ability to attach attached to some of these you know, unstable rocks on this 45 degree slope um, might not permit their 
their growth, their settlement. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is a lot of sediment here that you don't find in the offshore seamounts. So the sediments might be you know, smothering or you know reducing the potential for things like corals and sponges, stocked crinoids to settle in places. Or the flow conditions just aren't right. Oh yeah, where we have sediment and rock. Is that core sample territory? We did get a core sample earlier. We did? Yep. Yeah. yeah, the last watch did decided to do one. They were in a kind of a expansive sediment, so took advantage of it. I don't know, um I don't know if this has changed, but generally I think the best practices for coring is not to do it on a slope yeah. um, because uh, sediments are pretty unstable. Um, so if you want good stratigraphy, you probably want to do it on uh, in a more flat area. But I think there's a weather window coming up uh, over the next few days, maybe Thursday, Friday, where we may be able to poke our heads up a little bit northwards, see how things are. Swells under seven feet and winds below 20. Uh, but weather's been really variable here the past few days. And uh, we've had some storms yesterday, uh, some squalls come through, kind of pushed the wind conditions up beyond our Diving, diving limits, but uh, in a few hours after we finish this dive, we'll probably be moving on to another site uh, to be determined, probably to the east uh, and maybe to the north a little bit, um, but in the event of uh, poor conditions, we'll also have opportunities to come back into the lee of Kingman and Palmyra. When you say go back north to what we missed, you're talking back up to our Cayman Reef National Wildlife Refuge area? 40 meters. More up. to the north and east. Right. Uh, yeah, so still within the monument, but uh, change again? You know, outside uh, of the, the boundaries of the refuge. Feature kind of has yeah. petered out here. Okay. I'll see. Uh, there might be a little feature here to the left. A lot of the northeastern part of the monument has been completely unexplored, and there's actually a, a separate portion of the Line Islands Ridge that a lot of geologists think might be formed by a different process um, up in that region, kind of in the vicinity of uh, a site I called Seamount F, uh, but a little bit closer than that. Um, but we'll see what's within our range in about five to six hours time uh, to reach and maybe get back in the water this afternoon or this evening, perhaps. There's a stocky thing right here, Dan. We'll stop just, things in here. Yeah, just orange stock right. on the right, far right oh, side of the yeah. screen. How do you feel about doing a snip and slurp of this one as well? Can do. Let's do it. Bridge, no? You can uh, snip it and fly off if you need to. Also, if you don't want to. Uh, yeah, copy that. These, uh, this is a black coral, currently undergoing a bit of uh, taxonomic review, but um, we used to call this stichopathies, and it's probably actually in a different family entirely uh, than stichopathies, but, or, uh, yeah, family. So this is a this has been a collection target of interest um, to some of our scientists ashore for some time. We see this quite often, and it's always um, it's always kind of ignored. Uh, we've sampled it in certain parts, but it's always been a little bit ignored because it's been either abundant or uh, difficult to sample. But we're just going to take a small snip off the top here, a few centimeters. Um, to hopefully aid in the identification of this species within the boundaries of Kingman and Palmyra. 
add to the inventories for the monument since it's never been sampled here according to my records. So the sample can go into slurp container number six. Zoom in there a bit, Tim. Uh, while I'm getting them an imp out, you can do a full zoom there. Where are you going, ROV? Stay. Oh well, we're now above 2,000 meters. Officially. You missed everything, Dejano. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's the uh, scientific name for the unknown, the Judicus. I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> I don't think it's been crazy over the past 20 minutes. It's been yeah. pretty neutral. I was really worried that I was going to miss the big... Like us spiny Megalodon or something? Exactly. <laughs> spiny Megalodon. <laughs> yeah. Don't Some start that. <laughs> evidence or the stocked corals. The um, Those stocked corals we're looking at, the, the ones that branch in weird places. Yeah. I haven't seen one of those yet. Yeah, we, we saw actually, uh, I, I think it was right after you, well, right before you left, we had that coral wall. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right about then, we were trying to find our way back to the Paragorgia, and, and uh, yeah, I think that's when you took off. Yeah, so we've just been tracking up this kind of a high relief uh, ridge here, uh, trying to opportunistically sample any biology or rocks we see along the way. We tried to grab a rock out of the wall. Did you? I missed that. I missed the yeah. yeah. Failed miserably. That's <laughs> that's plenty, Dan. Thanks. I did write the first verse of the song, though. So. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> but I won't release it until Dan's been able to actually break off a piece of basalt. So, you know. <laughs> what, what is the name of our band again? I forgot. I don't uh, think we have one yet. Uh, really. Mystery Mucus Houses? <laughs> <laughs> or is that going to be one of the songs? <laughs> I think that was one of the songs. I can't remember the name. Yeah, were we like Delta Dan and Delta the Dan the, and the Arachnophobe Band. <laughs> oh, right. there we go. Delta Dan and the Arachnophobe Band. <laughs> they can uh, crank on the section now if they want. Okay. Okay, tell me. Oh, I'm going to see if I can find it. 50%? Sure. How many jars are we up to now? Oh, good. We've got one more after this. Yep. Did you get to some of these questions? Oh, yeah, zoom in there, Tammy. Yes. In the chat. Yeah, I think last one. Uh, Might have been. Was it the sneeze yeah. one? Because I'm yeah. kind of curious about that, too. Yeah, I think we touched on the sneeze one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious if uh, pilots are available to answer this one, because I'm curious too, is sneezing as terrifying when piloting an ROV as when driving a car? I think so, yeah. They, they might be busy finishing the sampling, so 
Okay. Just wait until they're done. Yeah, we'll go back to that in a little bit. Okay, because they're not telling me. Not oh, sure I heard the question right, but it's 99% boredom and 1% sheer sample. terror. <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer. I don't think that was the answer to that particular question, but it was a great answer. <laughs> The question was if it's if sneezing while ROV piloting is as scary as if as when you're driving. But maybe your answer does hold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would we like to continue along the ledge? I think so. Um Regroup here for. Uh, can you uh, bring your head left a couple yeah. degrees? And kind of see. There's another feature. It's gonna pop out. Okay, whenever you're ready. Feel like the general. Jordan. They thought you said shiny Megalodon, and they imagined it as a Pokemon. Just wanted to give you a shout out for that situation. Ah, uh, shiny Megalodon. <laughs> I guess it would be maybe red instead of gray. In the Pokemon world? Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, off to the next, where's their, where's okay. their waypoint? Our waypoint's far up the slope. Do they want to hit the waypoint, or are they... Uh, uh, I think it's a feature, so that's a good point there, because it does seem like it's gotcha. curving, or are we done with this one? Uh, it looks like there's a bit more, huh? Yeah, it does. Okay. Maybe head off again in the same uh, yeah. bearing where we were doing before. Let's do that short step while they're figuring out what's next. Roger. Bridge nav. Can we go five zero meters bearing three four So Steve, we're just doing a short five zero meter move um, along this, continuing along this feature. Um, but curious if you want to continue following the feature or start heading north up to the waypoint nine. Uh, you know, let, let's keep following the feature. This is about as good as we've gotten uh, during this today, uh, last watch and this watch. So let's follow it a little bit longer. Roger. The, the waypoints are more like guidelines. Zoom in, Tammy. Great. That's cool. Very cool. Yeah, so we've got uh, another carnivorous tunicate here. Tunicate. Mega Megalodocopia. What's on its... I was going to say lip, but they don't <laughs> have lips. They totally have lips. <laughs> it depends. If you put googly eyes on it. <laughs> <laughs> look like lips. Is it smiling? Like, yeah. what's happening? Uh, that's very interesting. I'm not <laughs> sure. It looks like some sort of attached hydroid or something. Zoom out just a bit. Cluster yeah. of hydroids. Um, Got a little something there on your yeah. face. <laughs> Needs a napkin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's rest or wash now. Sorry, I'm too close. No, it looks good. Thank you. I lost the light. The hurt brow. Lights are out in front. That was a good uh, 4K oh, one, though. Nice. Okay. Speaking of up. sneezing, 
and sponges. Question came in. Can sponges <laughs> sneeze? <laughs> I was wondering where that was going. <laughs> aren't, aren't, they al aren't they always sneezing? Apparently they can, they according can. to a study in 2014. Huh. Yep. Where, but this was in, in the laboratory where they exposed the sponges to different chemicals to cause a, uh, a sneezing response. That's weird. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta you gotta clean the sponge somehow. Otherwise, it gets all clogged up with all sorts of particulate junk. Gotta clear that stuff out, I guess. Yep. I'm just curious who came up with the idea. Like, hmm, I want to test a theory to see if a sponge can sneeze. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Maybe it was an observation that they made in, you know, in situ. Can we take a look at the sea star here? Ooh, a star. Right. Push in a bit it's there. actually been observed on the seafloor too, where sponges can reverse flow and just like blow out all the. Bit more if you want. Is that an albino slime star? Uh, no, I think that's a it's a goniasterid star. Um, We've kind of moved out of the depth zone for the slime stars. They're oh. a little bit deeper. We'll occasionally find them here and there, but... They're um, like below 2,000 meters? Yeah. We can see them shallower, but you know, they're more common, deeper, sure. But the goniasterids um, are yeah, often... The, or they're, sometimes they're called co cookie stars. Sure they're more there. common at these depths. Some of the, you know, th there is actually is a fair bit of biology here. It's just smaller. Um, you know, things don't form exceptionally large colonies as they do in perhaps more higher productivity areas. But is there a way to calculate the productivity of an area? Yes. Um, these days, most people use satellites, uh, which look at sea surface uh, color and through a series of calculations you can infer what the productivity is in the surface ocean in a you know, fairly small uh, fairly high resolution uh, is that enough steve or you want yeah that, 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 that that's okay or by botch there could find a perch it's good to keep moving moving As we continue moving up this path, I have a general question for you, Steve, as our biologist. If you couldn't be a marine biologist and study these deep ecosystems, what terrestrial ecosystem would you choose to study? Oh, Ooh. good question. Huh. I don't think we've had that kind of question before. Um, I, so, yeah, I, I, I think I would probably want to study urban ecology, like the, the ecology of the cityscape. It's, mm. it's very interesting to me, you know, how humans modify their environment and how animals will take advantage of that. So you really kind of understand what you know, animals are capable of after they've, you know, humans have moved in and set up their structures. Uh, it's always been kind of interesting to me. Urban ecology. Yep. I like it. That's cool. I think for me, I did deep sea uh, hydrothermal vent systems. I would want to do like another extreme system, mm -hmm. land-based desert, that like the Atacama yep. Desert or some some of the hottest spots on earth or the coldest spots on earth. Okay, tell me. I like the extremes. The thing that's kind of analogous to my research in the deep sea, though, is actually yeah, more like uh, alpine you know, research, looking at the biodiversity trends across you know a mountainscape or something. A lot of the drivers that control species distributions with altitude are also very similar in controlling species right. distributions with depth. So they're they're similar in some ways, but I think uh, 
if I couldn't go to sea, then I'd probably want to stay home, so I'd probably pick urban ecology. <laughs> I could see you up in the high mountains of Peru. <laughs> Some cool physiology questions on those ends too, deep sea ends, high altitude ends. Yep. We're just finishing up uh, this step. Any cause to stop and look around or continue on? Continue on. Dan, bearing looking good for you or keep turning? I think, uh, yeah, that bearing's fine. Okay. Bridge nav. One zero zero meters bearing three four five, please. This is a good uh, kind of indication of, you know, we have a great capacity to map the seafloor, but sometimes the mapping, you know, it doesn't resolve all of the interesting features that we are interested in if we're looking for rocks or hard bottom. So even though we can map the seafloor and plot it in you know, 25 or 50 meter grid sizes, we kind of lose all of this small micro topography. And so being able to adjust the dive plan as we go you know, slightly um, allows us to see potentially more things um, if hard substrates are what we're looking for. Follow the sonar, follow your eyes type exploration. Oh. Got a technical ROV question coming in. I'm not sure. I'm going to try my best to uh, paraphrase it. Um, can the ROV under full power cause a brownout of the power system or just draw more power than the system can handle? And would it take both ROVs with max power to do it or not at all? Uh, I'm asking this because I watched something like this happen on the o Okeanos. Yeah, it can if you if you uh, can see this image we have over here of uh, the high voltage cabinet as we call it, and uh, right now the ROV's <coughs> pulling 40 amps. Um, so basically, we try for 120 volts, just like you would have in your house to power the lights and instruments and stuff. But uh, when I step on the gas here that drops down to sometimes down to uh, like 90 some volts and that's because we're stepping the voltage up from 440 to uh, 2400 and then back down again so we bump it up to go down the wire so it, yeah it browns out the ROV and and it can increase the current draw and uh, last time that happened a couple of light fuses burned out on the vehicle. So voltage is, current's inversely proportional to the voltage. So the voltage drops, the current goes up, bad things happen. So what we do to alleviate that is we accommodate for the length of cable and uh, put as much input voltage as we can. So right now we have it dialed to 500 volts input from, from an inverter. So it should be like 460 if that was a commercial voltage from a, you know, like to a machine shop or something with big equipment. Hope that, I think that answers the question, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> and also the deeper we go, the, uh, the motor has to work harder oil gets colder and the viscosity it gets thicker like syrup so it uh, draws more current from the motor oh. I'm spun around Dan oh way too far yeah I'm way too far sorry I'll come back More fly and less talking. <laughs> <laughs> More fly. I'm going to pass this over to Jordan. I have another uh, interaction. 
So I'm going to sign off here, Dr. Dijana Figueroa, but I'll be back shortly. Have fun. Thanks. drop down here quickly Steve while we're waiting for uh, Argus yep yep sounds good starting to, away there. starting to lose uh, some of that diversity uh, that we had yeah. before I'm guessing it was because the currents were better there I'm noticing that there's a pretty heavy sediment drape in this area uh, which but. probably is why we don't see a lot of attached things a little canyon down here. Maybe yeah. Some shear walls to look at. Yep. Aside from being in the canyon, what's the current doing? Is it still downslope like last night? Um, I think so, yeah. Oh, we can oh. take a look at that. Uh, yellow and red colony there, if you have enough length. Uh, we do, should be coming our way. Let's zoom in a bit there, Tammy. Looks like a bamboo coral up top and then Looks like a Paragorgia colony with a zoanthid overgrowing it on the bottom. For a long time we were calling this um, one particular species of Paragorgia called Paragorgia coralloides. Uh, it's always been found or usually been found with this kind of associated uh, zoanthid. And uh, rarely is it ever seen completely overgrowing the you know, the host coral, but sometimes it does. So it kind of lives in this stasis in a way. And that's the sort of the dark, the brighter, darker Ooh. orange part. Yeah, the the orange part is a zoanthid. It's a uh, it's an anemone-like creature, uh, not the same group, but uh, related. And then. Uh, the, uh, the octocoral is the, the pink sea fan, kind of like the ones we were seeing before. Stuffed myself into the wall there. Did you get what you needed, Steve, or you want to try try? That, that was okay, that? yeah. That was okay. It's down in a hole there, and there's yeah. silt everywhere. It's a very silty place. Yes. I was talking with our expedition leader about the next dive site being in a potentially less silty place, but we'll try to make that decision ASAP as soon as we get off the seafloor here. Am I uh, pulling on you again? Uh, no, I'm pretty close to the wall on the port side. Yeah, watch it. You're going to have to come up. Yeah. Sam, let's all stop the ship and step. Uh, east 10 meters. East 20 meters. Roger. So stop the ship and stay here for a while or stop no. and change? Stop and have over 20. Bridge nav. Can we uh, change position uh, to... Sorry, what did you say? 045? No. East. East. 90. Zero, zero. Uh, 090. 090. Uh, two zero meters? Uh, yeah, 20 meters. Or I can come over and look at the other wall. Yes, please. Come Thanks. Up. Can I give it some laterals? No, just come up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come up, come up. Oh, great. Argus shot. We're going to have to... Uh, 
put Argus behind us to get up a canyon there. Got a wall on each side. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I like the Argus shot. It's cool. Another stalked crinoid. These red ones here. These are these are very characteristic of this region. Uh, we see these all over the place, from Hawaii down to Samoa. They um, it's a species called Proisocrinus rubrimus. Um, but the, at, right around this depth is where they're most common. Once she's uh, done with that, you can keep going. Uh, let's try the zero three zero for a while. Zero three zero. Roger. We'll do smaller steps going up the canyon. Oh, I should have caught it earlier and just changed the bearing. Nice B there on the sonar. Yeah. So Rebecca, I know we've touched on this before, but maybe for people tuning in, you could tell them uh, what sort of data that you guys are trying to hope to get from some of these rock samples that we're looking for. Yeah, of course. Um, so there are a couple of different objectives um, for the geologic side of this expedition. Um, those include collecting these rocks to see um, if there's any ferromanganese crust. Um, and in doing that, we want to get Coming the geochemical the um, composition of those crusts, as well as the volcanic rocks that yeah, they form around or congregate there. to. Okay. Um, there's also an objective to date some of these lavas as well, in order to get a better understanding of how Palmyra kind of fits into no, zero, three, zero, the, or the story of geologic zero, time four, of this region. That should bring us yeah. where we want to go, and then we can keep moving on. Canyon canyons are great places to grab rocks, but oftentimes they're you don't know if they're from this place, right? Or, or if it's just float, fallen from, mm -hmm. yeah. So everything looks loose, loose, but you know it could be from. Well, it's not going to be much from much further above. I mean, we only have yeah. 200 meters more uh, to go until we reach the crest of the platform here. You happy to go up the canyon, Steve, or do you want to get uh, back on that ridge top? Yeah, it's interesting. I think we can... It looks like it comes up about... Yeah, we'll yeah. get the feature again about yeah, I see. 20 meters ahead of us here. I, I mean, I, if we go up the canyon, I prefer the right side of the canyon where yeah, it goes up that, that wall. <laughs> <laughs> We're headed that way. The other side kind of just looks like lumpy. <laughs> Ship move underway. Get back over there. I think this was a conversation we had yesterday uh, about an egg shaped rock that was found on uh, <laughs> the last expedition. Did they ever found out what that was? We have not yet uh, busted into that um, at MGSL. Um, which is the rock repository at URI that takes 
Nautilus's geologic samples. Um, we're in the process of kind of unboxing everything from the 2021 season and the okay. objective of doing that is we'll three, cut them all open, describe them, and then put them into our repository. Um, so yeah, no idea as of yet what that egg shape thing is. <laughs> it's still a mystery rock. Still a mystery rock. <laughs> Rebecca, does the lab ever do like unboxing videos? <laughs> You know, we definitely should. Yeah. There were just so many, so many boxes sent to us in the beginning of the year. <laughs> you know, somebody had to pack those boxes. Oh, I know. <laughs> somebody. <laughs> somebody. T tell me how I did. <laughs> no, I, we, we worked in a team. We had a, four people packing that pallet. It was, uh, it was quite a day. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a day to... Uh, open them all up, dig through them, and kind of separate out the ferromanganese samples yeah. from NA-135. That took a while. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see there? The, there's like a brown, what is this? It looks like a blob. Not sure what it is. I'm gonna push in on the blob, unknown blob. Ooh. Is that a leaf? <laughs> it looks like a leaf, doesn't it's it? It's a leaf. Oh, oh, it's a leaf. It's a leaf. <laughs> Land thing. Yeah. So that took how long to get down here? Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's probably from the island, so hmm. probably a few months. But it's a canyon. It's a canyon, so it collects things. But the fact that that's not eaten even by something pretty quickly is surprising. Canyons are great places to look for kind of oddities. Okay, Tammy, zoom out a bit. This suggests that the, can the canyon probably gets, you know, the head of the canyon is probably, you know, straight up slope and probably just collects a bunch of debris. I mean, all these rocks just fall down into this canyon. Are you happy with this, this bearing? Yep. Okay. But when you need rocks, they're a good source of rocks. Wow, look at that anemone. She can't do uh, three, it's four, huge. five. Is that what's happening? Oh, that is big. A couple of them. I mean, yeah, there's, zero, four, yeah. Five. It's yeah, bigger than your head. Is <laughs> that zero, four, five? Looks like she's going that way. Yeah, she's, she's at struggling. three, four, five. Uh, no. Go on three one five. Yeah, it's gone off the other way, and I'm getting closer to that wall. There, I'm coming up, Dan. Roger. What? She needs a hold position, so like she's struggling. We're going off on. Yeah. Okay, I'm 20 meters from that wall now. All right, Joe. Wall of death approaching rapidly. <laughs> Ship's uh, taking a runner to the... Uh, Just straight into the wall. It's <laughs> great. Oh, she's... Yep. So are, are, are we totally... Yep. Oh, we're just rolling right now. She's okay. taking a holiday. up to one knot. Let's come up a bit, Antonella. Okay.
One knot with the wind. Yeah, the wind picked up briefly, but maybe it was Squall moving through. Push us off. Yeah, yeah she's, this happens occasionally. They're trying to get control of the ship on the bridge. Yeah. DP issues. We gave too much power to the ROE and browned out the ship. <laughs> so once we pass this waypoint nine, is that the top of the seamount where we're going to kind of plateau out? That's pretty much it. Yeah, there, there's a few more uh, alternate waypoints that I, I put into the top, but they kind of just coast along the okay. the rim of the, uh, the platform. But um, that's kind of it, you know. I think, uh, let's see, what do we got for time? So like we got another half an hour on this watch. They'll probably be able to get up there, cruise around a little bit, pick up a rock or, or so if they want from that area, and then uh, it'll probably be about time to start the ascent. Should be good there, Antonella. So it looks like she's got it under control. Okay. Yeah, kind of above the wall the now. Board, yeah. Where'd you, what'd you see, Steve? No, I was, I was looking at a Metallogorgia um, coral right at the bottom of the screen, just off now. Bottom of the screen. The ship is uh, stopped up now. So oh, yeah? Okay. She'll call back when she has it uh, under okay. control. Yeah. Yeah, the thrusters are still working pretty hard, but they <laughs> seem to be holding. Yeah, just, just off screen here, there's... Uh, Sorry, coming down. Uh, that guy. This critter, yeah. That was actually a couple of them here. Good to get some imagery, but we know what this is, and it's fairly easy to identify. We've sampled it extensively in this uh, Central Pacific, but... Okay, yeah, we're tracking forward again with the ship. What's she doing? Is she moving back? Or? Yeah. Um, you want to chase this? Uh, ask, ask her to hold for a minute. Hold position. Yeah. Bridge enough. If you're comfortable, we can hold position here. Uh, so we got blown off uh, 60 meters there, Steve? Yep. Do you want to uh, chase it up here? Do you want to move back over? Or what do you want? To uh, do? yeah. Let's uh, let's you know, let's just go up slope from where we are here. Right there. That would be uh, north again, I reckon. Mm, yeah. You want to go due or a little northeast? Zero three zero zero two know. one zero. Zero three zero. Is that a two or a three? Uh, zero three zero. Three zero, thanks. Bridge nav. Actually. We can continue with a five zero, zero meter zero step. Five. Zero, zero three four zero. Five. I oh. changed, changed uh, my mind. Sorry, bridge. <laughs> zero four five. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Argus is still, uh, the ship has stopped, but Argus is not. That's what's happening. This is interesting, uh, kind of flows through here. Yeah. Yeah, those are fun. This is a feature that happens uh, when you take an unknown excursion. <laughs> cool stuff. And we lined it up right next for the next watch. It's perfect. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We've been giving them all the best stuff, getting it all ready. <laughs> okay, we are underway with that move. Roger. Vargas is still uh, swinging. Yeah. The zero four five should correct that a zero bit. Zero four five. Yep.
Oh, wow, yeah. There's a very nice coral colony down there. If you're uh, at liberty. Yeah. Uh, should hopefully be closer. Argus should, in theory, be coming closer to Hercules here. Ooh, what is that? Pink floaty thing. <laughs> it's a, pink it's a floaty very thing. chill swimming sea cucumber. Cute. This, this is the thing, the first time I've seen a sea cucumber swim. Yep. Yeah, they do that. Probably going to get mad in a minute and swim faster. Yeah, they'll kind of... I, I don't know what kind of uh, motion I would best describe it as. Um, awkward? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I swim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a common ancestor. <laughs> Maybe we, we all inherited inherited our swimming skills from him. Come down a couple of meters. is very much a diva. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but this, yeah, this sea fan is what I'm curious about. Just uh, on the foreground from the red. Don't quite have the leash to spin around yet. We could okay. Look at it from this angle. We're still stretched. We're 30 meters away from Argus at the moment. Ship's moving in the right direction. Tammy, you can push in there. Oh, very nice. All right, so this looks like, based on the polyps that have started to close, uh, this looks like it could be in the genus Norella. It's a primnoid octocoral. A uh, number of brittle stars throughout the colony. It looks like the, the the tentacles are all closed and the polyps are unattracted though, which is kind of an odd uh, orientation. Um, Honestly, I couldn't get you to species on this one, but I think uh, I think we should be able to make some progress based on the imagery. I don't think we need a collection for this particular target. So, looks good here. We can uh, hold here for a minute. Still, still looks yeah. a Maybe little bit out of focus. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm really struggling getting it focused with all of our new setups. I'll, uh, I could turn off the porch light there. It's probably not helping. has moved 20 meters and Argus has not moved yet. Is the ship going to keep moving? Yeah, yep. we, okay. we've uh, we've sent her off on a course to get Hercules closer to Argus. I okay. mean Argus closer to Hercules. All right, I think we're all good here. Roger, okay. I'm going to hang out imagery. here for a minute until Argus starts moving. Because if I take off, I'll just pull pull Argus around. Okay. Antonella's breaking the two-digit rule there. <laughs> <laughs> I 
What's the two digit rule? Argus altitude. <laughs> She's dipping into it when the swells come through. That's why I keep the delta higher. That wall keeps coming back. I, I always watch that one. Oh, I'm just looking at the SVP. Oh, the real one. Yeah, but that's why I keep coming up on delta, because I keep breaking the rule. Yeah, we're good. On the, at, when you pull off, can you try and get these two things in the 4K as sure. you uh, sure. fly off? I'm just curious to see how the crinoids had a very different elevation altitude than uh, the coral. to see how they we get, look we get in the camera. Time to play around with that here while we're yeah. While she's catching up to us. We can try and get that crinoid, uh, the top of the red one, in uh, in the 4K. We can try maybe do a burst. Sure. If uh, if you have time, but no need to rush. We do, and now it's uh, happened to be at the right heading. And you want them both in there? This one. Yeah, let's do the let's do the crinoid. Uh, it's nice and red. You're gonna zoom on it, are you? Yep. Okay. I'll when you're ready. Stick up. And All right, get ready for a burst. Uh, no, not yet. No. Nope. Stable here. Okay, we should be in theory stable. All right, framed up. Yeah, I'm good. Ready to burst? I'm ready. Jordan, right. are you ready to record or to? Uh... Yep. All right, uh, recording. Okay. Good. It's a uh, 17:37. Okay, we've got 10 meters left on the ship move. Dan, do you want another bearing change or just continue north? Uh, uh. We were at zero four five. Let's continue on zero four five for a while. Great. Steve, any reason to stop? No. Uh, well, not that I know right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We'll hold you to it. We'll probably change your bearing in another 20 meters. Okay. Or so. Uh, I like this this ridge crest. If it continues like this, we'll see how far it goes up. Great. I'm hoping it becomes more populated. Yeah, we can do short steps. Bridge nav. Uh, three zero meters bearing zero four five. There's some more victims over here. Looks like maybe the current's blowing up over this ridge here. Yeah, can we take a look at that yellow one down there in the background behind the red? Sure. Uh, there. Dragon. Pushing the 
bit more if you want. Yeah, uh, as much as you can get me. That falls in, is it? Yeah, yeah, looks it's good. Full, full zoom. But why won't it focus? Is that more of those little house things? <laughs> yeah, Xenophyophores, yep. Yeah. So this is a, a family that I don't think we've seen yet. This is a plexorid octocoral. We saw these on the previous dive um, at uh, Kingman. But I don't think this is the exact species. It, maybe. Uh, it bears some resemblance, but. Uh, we have a fair number of plexoid collections from this area, so it's just good to get yeah, imagery yeah. and we'll compare with later. Um, um, okay, but... Or three um, meters. That looks okay. good. My altitude's pretty um, close to science. 10, and I'm and still pretty close to that wall. But I can two, come down. Two meters. So. Okay. Looks good on science. Can continue. Uh, you want to keep moving? Is yep. I'm here? Yep. Okay. We got 20 meters left on a ship move. 17 now. Yeah, we'll keep on this uh, bearing. Do okay. another one. Great. Steve, keep going. Keep on going. Yeah. Ridge, right up this ridge. Yeah. We can add five zero meters to this bearing. Thank you. Eighteen forty. Okay. Yeah, that's about the depth where we start seeing the plexoids. They start appearing around two thousand meters or so. So, spot on. Actually, we've got about 18 minutes until 8, so 15 till our watch change. Assuming we want to set the vehicles down before uh, handing over? Um, no, we don't need to this time. Okay. Um, let's change our bearing to 090 for a few minutes. Roger. I'll just do a shorter step. Bridge nav. I have to come up. Yeah, you do. Can we change to uh, two zero meters, bearing zero nine zero? Do a longer move, Sam. Let's do 40 meters. Yeah. Okay. And bridge, can we actually do four zero meters? Wow, that's a heck, it's a heck of a bamboo coral. A couple meters, maybe? At least a meter long. Yeah, that one's really long. We're trying to get Argus out. They're in the deep water to okay. behind her. Okay. How long can they grow up to, bamboo corals? Uh, I'm not sure of the l maximum length. Uh, you know, we've definitely seen them meter and a half, two Come meters. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there, there this, really isn't sort of a limit up in front of me. Is that okay? to how long they could yep. grow, okay. as long as they can sustain the entire colony. Right. Um, but, you know, all it takes is one sea star or one predator and uh, things to start to go downhill fast for... Zoom in there, Tammy. ...these types of uh, corals. But this is a fa fairly uh, common... I want to say it's like B or D clade, I think, for uh, this depth. Single unbranched coral. We sampled several of these last year, kind of uh, both accidentally and uh, deliberately uh, in the waters around Hawaii. But uh, in this area, okay. I think they've been sampled I once come before. Away from that feature now. Yeah, I think you're good. A 
it a baby at the base there in 4K or is it a different one? Uh, let me, can I zoom in and take a look? I'll bring the Zeus around here for you. Push in a bit there, damn it. It's a fair bit of diversity here, yeah. Um, different also than uh, a bit deeper. Can we pop a Niskin in this area? We can. I'm gonna ship hold in. You could do it on the fly if you need to, or if you can. Yeah, we can hold. Oh, uh, no, no, ship, keep moving. Ship yeah, move. Yeah, yeah, we need that. Ship we need Argus moving. needs to be out in the deep water behind Herc there. Great. So, all the ship's moving, I'll pull on this good. Great, we've got 25 meters left. On the move. Got it. So, in this area, we have um, a bamboo coral, a primnoid, uh, Metallogorgia, it's a Chrysogorgia. We've also got a, a colony of Victorgorgia, which is this purple coral in the background. It's one we haven't seen on this dive so far. So this is a good candidate area. We've got four or five species just in this very small patch here. Um, so it would be a good candidate for an eDNA um, yeah, I've been to collection. Happy to pull the Niskin here in this. You want and the move? species we find here are different from our last eDNA sample, so it should be. Nice comparison. What sort of sample did you say we're taking? Uh, environmental DNA. Environmental DNA. DNA. Yeah. Oh, uh, full wide, Tammy, if you're not already. I am full wide. Thank you. This will be uh, our third bottle of the dive. If you want to pop Niskin 4, that works. Niskin 4, right there. That's the orange one. <laughs> yes, we're doing a environmental DNA sample. Because there are multiple. And Rebecca, this is life sample 17? Yes, it is. Thanks. Yes. Pop it. So that's at. Uh, where are we in depth? 1833 meters. Can you show me the craft? The bubble yeah. cam. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the area we've got uh, Corrado Ice today, Primnoid Noarella, I think. Metallogorgia and Victor Gorgia. Good. Great. Good collection. Yeah, 12 meters left on the ship move. Right there. Looks like Argus hasn't started. We've moved a little away from the wall. Um, it should swing out past her. We're coming over here now. Yeah, right. Don't know if the timing's right, but a question for Antonella and Dan. Have we ever encountered anything down here that wanted to fight the ROV? <laughs> Sharks. <laughs> to fight it or bite it? <laughs> yes. Oh, really? Yeah, we had a shark. Uh, Pick up one of the, uh, you can see the tether floats in, um, in Argus occasionally. There's two uh, football sized floats on the tether. We had a shark grab a hold of one of those. Uh, when was that? Was that on? I think that was on the uh, Shakedown cruise. When? Really? Or maybe it was Shakedown? last year. Like last no, week? It was last, last year. Definitely okay. was it last year? <laughs> it was December. <laughs> <laughs> they all blur Time together. Time oh, Dan. Well. <laughs> the difference between last week and last year is a little. <laughs> Probably all the same. <laughs> and it was NA something. <laughs> 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 oh, 
or a NA-137, so choose, take your pick. <laughs> We've had uh, encounters with crabs before where they have uh, start to put up their defenses. Oh, yeah, they, all, they always crabs. posture. Yep. <laughs> Come on, ROV, I'll take you on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we always get the fish that we just pretty much blind, and they just run right into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> But they're not quite attacking us. They just don't know where they're going. The rays do too. They fly right in. And actually, get uh, themselves stuck. Yeah, that's so. Actually, attacking. Uh, there's a funny story, especially when you work in the Pacific Remote Islands out here. You run into these fish called Oreos a lot. Um, sometimes they're called Oreo dories, but um, uh, the family name is Oreo somatidae. And uh, these fishes typically you find between maybe 1,200 and 600 meters. And uh, they really are, they're really territorial. So much so that if they come up to the lens on Herc's main HD camera, they'll see their reflection <laughs> and they'll start nipping up the oh, lens yeah. because wow. they're trying to eat the reflection of the territorial fish out of there. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah, they're really neat. Is, yep. So that's it? Yeah, yeah. Antonella, can you spin in such a way that takes half of that yeah, to so the they, turn out? They, 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 they yes. definitely can see something uh, because they're looking at you know, the reflection and they're biting the lens. We've had that like, a couple uh -huh. times, yeah. If, um, if you've ever been scuba diving on a coral reef, uh, things like Sergeant Majors in the Caribbean do the same thing. They're very territorial damselfish. They'll come and bite Sorry. Uh, you know, invaders. That's cool. That was a great question because I was like, I don't know, should I ask it? But I'm kind of curious too. Okay. Yep. So the answer is yes. <laughs> yep. Well, that ship moves complete. Great timing. Are you going to? Um, are you interested in this guy, Steve? Or? Uh, not not particularly. But if you need to do a handover. Yeah, it's that time. Yep. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> it's been fun. I'm out. See you, Dan. All right, Delta Dan. It's an anthemastus in this area, too. I'll add that to the list. Anthemastus mushroom coral. We're coming to the end of our watch here, so Delta Dan and the arachnophobe band <laughs> is going to be signing off shortly. Funny. It's been real. <laughs> Thank you for all of your questions. Actually, that's pretty neat. I wonder if that's a wood fall there. Huh. Like actual wood, wood? Yeah, wood. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, there's I some meat down it. here. Oh, some, right there. Sometimes wood. Yeah. There's there's a bunch of things here. Like there's a coral here that's very faint. Um, but there's yeah wood when it sinks to the seafloor. As it decomposes, there's a lot of different types of animals that will feed off of the decomposing carbon. And uh, they can support really unique habitats that are totally different from uh, the species that are, t are totally different from the surrounding environment. So it's almost like a well fall, like a different type of microhabitat yep. created. Microhabitat, yep. <laughs> but we did see a, a leaf when you were away. No. So one leaf. We tagged that, right? That was definitely a five. <laughs> <laughs> leaf at, was it 1,900 meters at the time? Yep, just there about. A leaf at 1,900 meters depth. That's actually kind of cool. It wasn't attached to a tree or anything. No, <laughs> but I mean, we might have some botanists watching that are trying to characterize exactly where I'm sure you could identify it. It was very, it, it, was, it was on the plane, so. Could we use an app? Because you know now we have apps where you take the picture and it tells you what it is. What is that? When are we going to have that for corals? Steve, can you work on that, please? Uh, I'd like a deep sea coral app where. Yeah, let's discuss royalties first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where I can. Um, <laughs> Follow Nautilus Live and just use the, the app you've developed to <laughs> identify the different corals. Yeah. Let's do that. That'd be cool. It'd I'll be like a Pokedex, but with coral. I'll do that if I uh, if okay. I can if I can make some money off of it. I'll do that. That's a real thing, though. They yeah. have those now for all sorts of things. Go into the tech tech business. Yeah, I, I can I can I can do some I can do some app design. <laughs> so like we want to do a startup. <laughs> I know it's 
so it'll be a <laughs> kind of a niche audience, but <laughs> definitely niche. <laughs> but you know what? We have uh, we have quite the crowd. All those Nautilus live, so at least I know we'll have like a couple dozen customers, maybe. <laughs> what do you say, Nautilus live out there? Are you down for an app where you can just take photographs of what we're seeing and it could help you identify them? That would be really cool. Looks like I'm I'm trucking over here to the east. Oh, oh okay. All right, so we're all um, stretched out. Like that's you. Yeah. officially a wrap for our watch. Delta Dan and the Arachnophobe Band Watch is signing off. Enjoy the rest of your time with the next crew. So he's so he steps east, and now we're going north, north again. Oh, it's because we lost TP shortly. Zero two three. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're cool. Just get going. Yep. Yeah. Mm. 